Good morning, and welcome to the Fall 2017 Symposium of the Journal of Law and Public Policy. My name is Mohamed Abu Mayale, and I have the honor and privilege of being the journal's editor-in-chief. The title of today's symposium is Sex Trafficking, Addressing a Global Conflict in Our Backyard. And we aim to do just that, look at how we can address a global conflict that is very prominent here in Minnesota. Our speakers today include Representative Dave Pinto, Dr. Lauren Martin, Mr. Andy Luger, Judge Jamie Cork, and Ms. Linda Miller. Our aim is to examine the various aspects surrounding sex trafficking and how the legal system has addressed these, some of the successes of the way we've addressed sex trafficking and some of the shortfalls, and what is needed to continue to com combat this issue. Our first speaker is State Representative Dave Pinto. Representative Pinto is an assistant minority leader in the Minnesota House of Representatives, where he represents the Highland Park and McAllister Groveland neighborhoods of St. Paul. He also serves as the assistant Ramsey County attorney, specializing in prosecuting crimes of gender violence. Mr. Pinto was also the statewide, Representative Pinto was also the statewide director of training and protocol development for Safe Harbor, Minnesota's system for combating the sexual exploitation of young women, young people. Please join me in welcoming Representative Pinto. So um, uh, many thanks to uh, the University of St. Thomas School of Law and also the Journal of Law and Public Policy for, um, for hosting this and hosting me. Um, as, uh, as Muhammad said, uh, I, am, uh, I serve as, as a state representative, as a um, prosecutor, and also um, in this role directing training and protocol development for the Safe Harbor system. And, and what Safe Harbor is, um, I'll describe a little bit more um, a little later. Um, I thought that it be, would be useful today to start um, by examining the issue of sexual exploitation and sex trafficking as part of the uh, broader fight against gender violence um, and to consider uh, where we are and where we're going with regard to sexual exploitation by considering where we've been and where we are with respect to other forms of, uh, of gender violence. Um, and so we need to start then by considering what uh, gender violence, what, I, what do I mean by gender violence? Um, and as you can see, and this, by the way, many of the terms I'm going to be using, uh, I hope this doesn't upset the law students who are accustomed to um, carefully citing things and making sure we're having, having precise references. These are just working, working terms that I'm going to be using throughout the presentation. Um, as you can see, um, uh, gender violence uh, uh, I'm using to mean these, uh, these forms of violence that are based in gender inequities and where there's a disproportionate impact on women, but of course an impact on uh, people of all genders. Um, and so when I talk about this, I'm really thinking about three general areas. Um, I come to this work as a prosecutor of domestic violence, is my particular background, before focusing on exploitation and trafficking. Um, I think that we're, uh, we're fairly familiar with those top two circles, and I'll talk more about the bottom circle uh, in a bit. But let's consider um, traditionally how people thought about domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, and when I say traditionally, uh, again, the time frame here is, is pretty slippery. Um, you can go back to, uh, to the 1950s, you can go back to prehistory, you can go back to really anywhere between there. But just speaking very generally, this thought that women's bodies and their sexuality really are um, male property, on the property of their fathers, property of their husbands. Uh, there even, in fact, was uh, this concept in, uh, in English common law um, that the woman, when she marries the husband, becomes a part, her body becomes a part of his body, in fact. Um, and therefore, um, uh, in, uh, to a certain extent traditionally, some level of spousal violence is acceptable. It may even be encouraged as a means of some form of control. It can't go too far, and you'll see this reference to, um, to if permanent injury is caused, well now that is going too far. That's from a North Carolina case um, from the 1860s. Um, but if we don't have permanent, uh, permanent injury, pardon me, then, uh, then that's not something that is, uh, that is a concern um, under the law. Um, sexual assault, similarly, is, is a harmful thing um, to the extent that it interferes with male property rights. Um, there's uh, Minnesota law for a long time um, uh, defined uh, sexual assault as forced intercourse with a woman who is not the dependent's wife. Um, there was no such thing as sexual assault, sexual violence in the context of marriage, marital rape. 
Um, and I mentioned the English common law earlier. Uh, uh, that was one of the reasons the English common law said that uh, the marital rape was not possible, because if the woman's body is part of the man's body, well, then rape would be uh, the man assaulting himself, sexually assaulting himself, and that wouldn't be possible. So we can understand uh, where this is coming from. Um, uh, where these beliefs uh, would then lead to these conclusions. And finally, relationship violence is, is not something that the government and the society really has a right to intrude in. Um, you can see a case from the 19, uh, teens, 1910, in the U.S. Supreme Court um, that points out that, uh, that you know, we can't have a woman um, being able to sue her husband for assault um, because there could be accusations of all sorts back and forth. Um, it's not really society's business what is going on um, inside of a domestic relationship. And coupled with that is the belief that, look, a woman would leave uh, a man, uh, a partner, if he is being truly abusive. And if she doesn't, that must be a, a reason to believe the abuse is really not that bad. So uh, as a result of this, um, uh, of course, uh, early on, there's no enforcement, there's no laws, but even as laws change, even as uh, there are um, laws that are more um, in place against domestic violence, against sexual assault in the context of a relationship, um, there's very little enforcement of that. Um, there's uh, uh, policies, police departments in California and Michigan that are cited here um, that have actual policy directives saying we should avoid uh, arrest, um, uh, we want to keep the, keep the couple together. And, um, and perhaps you need to appeal to the victim's vanity was the term that is used um, to say, well, this is not something that you'd want to have other people be involved. You'd want to have your, your spouse be arrested. And there's certainly no formalized services for victim survivors. Um, this is, again, the traditional view over time. Um, well, we uh, start having a paradigm shift, and I'm really fixing this um, moving into the, the 1970s. Um, originally, you can see from those slides, um, we're judging victim survivors. And, uh, and offenders, we really are justifying their conduct. We're explaining why it is that it's, that it's acceptable for them to be committing the violence that they are. We have a real shift here to protecting victim survivors and to holding offenders accountable. So what does that mean? Well, it means in terms of the services, uh, we do start having some services and support in place. We have some individual heroes. Um, is the term that I'm using. Some individual people who say, um, yes, I'm going to found a domestic violence shelter. I'm going to found a rape cr crisis center. Um, I'm a nurse, and I'm going to get some specialized training to be sure that I understand the dynamics of sexual assault and how I can, how I can help. I'm a judge. I'm going to go out of my way to impose a new kind of an order to say that this person should not have contact with this person. This husband should not have contact with his wife because of the violence that he's, uh, that he's putting in place. We also have greater accountability for offenders. Um, mandatory arrest policies saying if an officer arrives at a home and believes there's violence from one party um, against another, one member of a couple against another, then there's a, a, an arrest is required. And actually, um, that kind of policy is needed to tell the officer, no, you can't say, well, it's maybe just best for the family, I should leave alone. No, if that's the determination you've made, you have to arrest. Um, uh, criminalizing uh, sexual assault in the context of marriage. Having it be that sexual assault laws are based not just on force. You saw on the previous slide that there's a reference to forced intercourse with a man who's not, with not, who is not the, uh, the victim's um, spouse, but actually um, recognizing that consent is necessary. And there may be situations that constitute se sexual assault without there being force involved. Um, and even uh, uh, laws, and, and uh, I was surprised to note as I was researching this as early as 1975, um, rape shield laws saying that uh, a victim's past sexual history is not relevant, may not be admitted in a current sexual assault case. Um, a number of these innovations uh, were founded here in Minnesota. For those who are not familiar, this is, um, I think, really important to realize. There's something called the Duluth Model that is known around the country, founded in the early 1980s, a domestic abuse intervention project. Um, a program that, uh, that brought together a number of these innovations of having shelters in place, mandatory arrest, having intervention programs for batterers um, and others. So uh, we start having then um, another paradigm shift as we move closer to the present day in these other forms of gender violence. So we had these individual heroes providing support for, for, for victim survivors. Um, and we've got some basic accountability for offenders. Well, now as we move to the present day, we're really institutionalizing that support. And we're really closing some of the gaps that we see beyond the basic accountability 
um, to expand and make sure that we're really holding offenders accountable and leading them to, uh, to, uh, to stop doing the violence um, that they're perpetrating. So what does the institutionalization of support mean? Well, there is ongoing federal and state funding for, uh, for services, um, as much as $35 million a year in Minnesota, which is wonderful. Um, that's a far step beyond an individual person uh, founding a shelter and having to do the kind of fundraising, um, I think in some cases, bake sales and other basic things um, back in the day. Now we are saying as a society, this is something that is worth providing public funding, funding from all of us to support. Um, the formalization of advocacy as a profession. Um, this is not just an individual person trying to get whatever information they can, but having advocates be in a position, be recognized um, for the key role that they're playing, and have the kind of uh, support and formalization um, that, that provides that. Um, related to that, uh, instead of these individual nurses, um, we now have sexual assault nurse examiner programs, uh, SANES they're called. It's a recognized subspecialty of nursing. Um, instead of, uh, you know, you show up in the emergency room, if you're lucky that the individual nurse has received the training, that's great, but maybe she's gone that day. Well, now we make sure we have coverage, 24-7 coverage, um, at least moving in that direction. And then statutory orders for um, uh, prohibiting contact. Instead of an individual judge saying, I'm going to do this on my own, we now have it in statute. Um, and ongoing updates to laws. And I just listed a number of things here um, that, uh, that passed... Uh, evidence regarding past interactions between the victim and the defendant can be, can be relevant in the current case more broadly than might be the case with, uh, with just under the rules of evidence. Um, uh, past domestic crimes uh, will increase the severity of the current crime. Uh, there's a new crime from 2005 of domestic assault by strangulation and providing for expert testimony coming in. Now, if you look at the dates, you'll see um, we're building up, 1985, 1995, 2005, building up and building up. There's a lot, there are a lot of gaps to be filled. I should point out, I mentioned about having 24-7 SANE coverage, right? There's certainly many places in Minnesota that do not have that kind of coverage, but we're certainly a lot farther along than, uh, than we were. So we need to keep on moving forward, and we are, and I think many of us are aware of this, a, a focus on homicides and domestic violence situations. The Minnesota Coalition for Battered Women has really brought that out. A big focus on campus sexual assault. I suspect a number of students are very familiar with that. Um, uh, move towards uh, requiring affirmative consent. Certainly training for students and staff. In the news, especially recently, has been a focus on the assault and harassment uh, that, uh, that many women experience um, and almost all women have experienced at some point in their lives. We've especially focused on that in the workplace, and I think a lot of news and a lot of awareness of that. So that brings us up back to this. Um, so we've talked about these top two uh, circles and where we've come. So what about this, this bottom circle? We probably need to set a few terms, and I hope that most folks have seen uh, the training uh, uh, video and information that was uh, submitted, uh, provided before. Um, when we talk about sexual exploitation, we're really talking about uh, sex trafficking and some broader pieces about, of exploitation as well. And just to be sure we're, we're, we're clear on this, um, Minnesota's law on sex trafficking has a whole lot of terms. There's a citation here, um, and you'll note a series of uh, statutory provisions cited, but it really boils down to this. When you've got prostitution, involving a third person in some way, that is sex trafficking under Minnesota law. Recognizing that inherently when a third person is, um, uh, is benefiting from this exchange for sex, uh, for money, for food, for shelter, whatever it is, that is inherently coercive. And as I hope you're already aware, it doesn't matter whether the victim survivor consents, it doesn't matter the age, it doesn't matter whether force is used. Under Minnesota law, it's very simple in that way. Exploitation, um, uh, again, has um, a number of definitions. For my purpose, I'm really talking about trafficking and, and prostitution and a broader set of circumstances where someone who is vulnerable, often a minor, though not exclusively a minor, is involved in some way with survival sex, uh, having to do a sex act for a place to stay or for food, um, pornography, pornography stripping, etc. I should note that a lot of Minnesota's focus on sexual exploitation as it's been the case for trafficking, too, has been on, on exploitation of minors. Um, and so the definitions in the sites there focus on exploitation of minors. But more broadly, if you have a vulnerable adult, that's exploitation, and certainly um, sex trafficking um, and prostitution as well. So traditionally, the response to exploitation has been to believe that um, prostitution is, uh, is a public nuisance. 
it's a problem. It's a bad thing. Um, because it's harmful to men and to society. We really haven't focused traditionally very much on the harm to the person who is being sold. Um, the belief is there's really no victim except for the, the, the man's family and perhaps um, society. Um, and this is to the extent we're even paying attention. I should point out exploitation of minors we haven't paid much attention to at all traditionally. Um, and therefore, <clears throat> um, the sale of sex is penalized more severely than the purchase. The latter traditionally may not have been penalized um, at all. Um, the great majority of arrests focus on the person who's being sold rather than the person who is doing the purchasing. Um, and, you know, we uh, traditionally were very comfortable if there is a, a minor who is prostituting, um, even in cases as young as nine years old, that child will be charged with prostitution on the juvenile delinquency statutes. If the child is, if the situation is, um, is not ignored altogether. Um, I've cited the delinquency statute pointing out that um, any crime committed by an adult can be charged, uh, a child can be charged with, except for some traffic offenses. <laughs> so traffic offenses you can't charge kids, but a child who is being prostituted can in fact be charged. Um, so there's been uh, a shift um, uh, over time, um, pardon me, here we go, um, with, uh, with a greater focus on traffickers um, there have been some uh, uh, expanded definition of sex trafficking. Um, just as recently as 2009, there have been longer sentences. I should note that uh, a case that I worked on, um, the defendant's name there, uh, Antonio Washington Davis, he was convicted of sex trafficking and I believe it was 2011, uh, and uh, received a probationary sentence. He was then convicted again of sex trafficking several years later, a larger number of victims, and had a 36-year sentence. So a real shift. Um, and there's been a paradigm shift with respect to minor victim survivors. So that's been the area we've had a real mind shift. Um, nationally, uh, there have been, uh, been safe harbor laws that have been adopted. So this is where I kind of explain what that is. Um, these laws that redirect um, children who are being prostituted from the juvenile delinquency system to the child protection system and providing them services and support. <clears throat> In addition, nationally, uh, there are, uh, there's been a focus on internet crimes against children. So child pornography, solicitation, et cetera, and a lot of uh, support and funding and direction there for law enforcement. In Minnesota, we've adopted that, that ICAC um, model and provided support there. Um, but we also have adopted the Safe Harbor uh, program and, and, and approach as well. This started in 2011, as you'll see, where some county attorneys said, uh, we are not going to charge minors with prostitution any longer. Um, the next couple years, we adopted the safe harbor model. So now kids cannot be charged with prostitution. Minors are directed to, to the child protection system. There's the services and support. We're up to more than $10 million. Professionals are being trained. So a lot is happening with respect to minor uh, exploitation of minors. So this is a map of the um, safe harbor uh, regions in the state divided into a number of regions. And you can't see the icons very well. But basically, when you see just those little pictures, the little images, uh, the icons, each of those is some kind of service and support that the state is funding that there's support for. So um, there's a lot more to be done, but with respect to kids, with respect to minors, um, we have a lot that's going on, a lot of impressive things. Now, as part of that, some of that has had some uh, expansion to adults um, as well. Um, uh, training has happened all over the state in all those regions of law enforcement and others. Um, I was actually the director of that work. Um, thousands of law enforcement and other professionals. Um, and that training certainly has included responding and identifying to exploitation of people of any age. So that's great. Uh, and that's, uh, that's been included uh, recently as 2015. Um, Safe Harbor services have expanded really recently to include up to age 24, which is wonderful. Law enforcement's targeting buyers. But um, when you compare this slide with this, it's pretty weak, I think you'd agree. We've got all these things going on for kids. There's not a lot happening for adults. The fact is our laws still treat the people who do the purchasing and the people who are purchased as equally culpable. It's, uh, it's, it was important to me that folks um, just see that um, there's, um, uh, it's a misdemeanor of prostitution in a private place. It's a gross misdemeanor in a hotel, a car, a massage parlor, whatever it is. But those are equal. It doesn't matter whichever direction that you're going. And that's actually better than it is nationally. I was amazed in putting this together to realize that half the states um, still do not criminalize the buyer. They still only criminalize um, the person being sold. And still, 
the ma great majority of arrests are of the person who is being sold. Now, why is that a problem? Why is that a problem? Uh, I hope that, uh, again, the, the folks uh, took advantage of some of the, the, the preparatory materials to get a sense of the dynamics of exploitation. Um, I'm pulling this from, uh, this from uh, one of those slides. Um, you know, we now understand the basic model and dynamics of trafficking, that we have someone who is very motivated by money in the form of the trafficker. We have someone who, is, who feels very entitled in the form of the buyer. He has money and he's entitled to have his sexual needs met. And it really doesn't matter what the impact is on the human being um, who, is, who is supposed to be meeting those needs. And we now know that that human being at the bottom of that triangle was targeted because of vulnerabilities that she has. Um, uh, and uh, I really uh, cannot think of a survivor who I've gotten to know who has not had some just really, really significant vulnerabilities um, in, her, in, her, in her life that someone was taking advantage of. So we separate out the traffickers from the buyers, but really what we have is we have exploiters on both of these sides. And we now understand that when you have um, uh, money taking the place of consent, um, that that really is what's happening really is it's, it's sexual violence, commercial sexual violence. And um, so it doesn't fit this, this model where at the very best there's an equivalency between the buying and the selling. It doesn't fit our understanding of the real dynamics of this system. Um, and you know, related to that, just starting to drive into the practicalities of the, of the problem, um, this is very confusing for criminal justice professionals and for the public. Again, I've been around the state training thousands of, um, of professionals, and, and they get it, that last slide I showed. It's good, it's solid, it's great, and yet we, and, and they understand that we don't make a distinction between kids and adults when that dynamic kicks into place. When it comes to trafficking, prostitution involving a third person, it doesn't matter if it's a kid or adult, it's still sex trafficking, and yet, and yet, we then say, ah, but the person who is being sold and the person who's doing the buying are equally culpable. Um, it, it ends up really being confusing. It certainly sends a message to traffickers. And it sends a message to buyers, to men considering buying, um, to say, well, yeah, what I'm doing is wrong, but what she's doing is equally wrong. And I feel like doing it, and I guess I'll pay the money. And she's, you know, can't be that harmful for her because, you know, it's the equivalent penalty, it's the equivalent thing. We're both. Um, we're both equally culpable. Um, it certainly sends a message to those who are prostituted and sold. Um, not only just the basic fact of you are a criminal via your exploitation, but you are equally a criminal to the person who is being paid to violate you. And I gotta say, if our goal, to the extent our goal is to hold traffickers accountable on that piece, it certainly hinders our ability to do that. Because the people who know the traffickers best and can best provide support in doing that work um, are those who are being exploited, and we are certainly not uh, engendering cooperation from someone who probably wouldn't be inclined to be cooperative and engage with us in the first place for all sorts of reasons. Um, so uh, there is a proposal, um, and there are thoughts, this, this is the next step, the movement here, um, to have safe harbor for all. Just like we've redirected kids from the juvenile justice system to the child protection system, to redirect adults from the criminal justice system to services and to support. Um, so that would involve repealing penalties for the purchase, for, this, for the, for the um, sale of sex, I should say. Whoops, that was a mistake, for the sale of sex. Um, and recognize that the purchase of sex really is a form of gender violence. So that means that we probably need to be increasing the penalties on the other side, offering treatment as appropriate, um, and, and recognizing um, where that is. Um, what this would do is to communicate clearly and effectively about how we really view this, to understand that triangle and make that, uh, make that communication. Um, now, this model is in use in a number of other countries. And it's actually referred to, form of it anyway, as the Nordic model. Um, it uh, was pioneered in Sweden and used in other Scandinavian countries. Um, relatively recently adopted in Ireland. Um, Canada sort of has been making moves towards it as well. It has been proposed in Minnesota. It was proposed in 2015-2016 uh, uh, legislative session. It had bipartisan support. Um, I felt the need to point out my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I want to point out a bipartisan support. Um, and I'm happy to say in 2017, this current session, uh, there was funding that was passed um, to uh, support a study by the Minnesota Department of Health to examine how can we have um, 
comprehensive plan statewide to meet the needs of all sex trafficking victim survivors, which may well may well lead to this, and maybe the plan leads leads to something else, but it ends up giving us this consistent, um, consistent approach. I, I want to point out, so I find this very appealing, but I want to point, point out that there are some real hurdles to our adoption uh, of it. And one important distinction is the fact that we, as far as I can tell, would be coming at this from a real different route than other jurisdictions. And here's what I mean. I'm sorry, those squares are a little low, low on the slide. Um, all the other jurisdictions that have done this, as far as I can tell, went from a regime where they had full legalization and then made the decision to criminalize the purchase of sex. We are in a position of having full, um, full criminalization and so would be making the change potentially, as part of all the other changes, of decriminalizing the sale of sex, which can be very uncomfortable for, for some people to say, well, we're, we're going to target this um, crime uh, so strongly that we're going to actually decriminalize half of it. Well, no, that's not, um, that's not the goal. What we want to do is to recognize the victimization of the people who are experiencing it. Um, but that can be a hurdle. And, and connected to that is what will the effect be on our, on our communities? There's concern that, uh, uh, that when prostitution is in certain neighborhoods, um, and it's something that people are seeing on the streets, because, of course, the vast majority is online now, um, I've certainly heard some concerns about what the effect um, might be. Um, uh, there's a question of uh, services and support for victim survivors. I mean, so the safe harbor system, there's all those uh, housing and shelter and services all around the state. It would be terrific if we had that support for adult victim survivors as well, and I hope that we do. But as we know, there are a lot of claims on state funding and a lot of challenges, and we are not doing this in the same context as the other countries uh, that have adopted the Nordic model, certainly not um, Scandinavian, uh, the Scandinavian countries um, that have the kind of social safety net that, uh, that we lack. Um, and, you know, consider the speed of change here. Um, I described the, the, uh, the change in domestic violence and sexual assault, uh, certainly 1970s and on, and to a certain extent some of that began much earlier. Um, you may have noticed some of the years when I talked about sexual assault, uh, sexual exploitation, we're talking about 2008, 2009, the first safe harbor law adopted in New York in 2010. Um, this is a very, very quick um, uh, pace of change, which can be very, very difficult. Um, compared to, to um, a DWI, driving while intoxicated, um, there too, back in the 1950s, there was one view of, oh, no big deal, maybe even the happy drunk. And then over time, we say, no, no, this is a serious, serious public health issue, and we're moving over time. But we've had decades to be making those changes and having society and laws move. We're trying to move this very quickly. And we really are, the phrase that, uh, that uh, a number of us use is, uh, we're building the plane while we fly it um, on this, uh, uh, for this offense and for this situation. Um, now that our eyes have been opened, which again, for many of us, has been just in the last few years, we suddenly realize how prevalent this is. It's incredibly prevalent. Um, and we're trying to build in services and support for the people experiencing it and develop a new regime um, uh, all at the same time. So it's very, very challenging. Um, so, and, and we need to recognize that as part of this, um, part of this work, this is grounded in, in, uh, in gender inequities and also in vulnerabilities. Um, uh, comparing to, again to those Nordic um, countries uh, where this originated, um, so societies that have uh, many, fewer, many fewer gender inequities, many, much more gender equity than ours does, and again, much more support for, uh, for those who've experienced um, uh, trauma and, and providing support for people. Um, there was a young woman who, uh, uh, a 16-year-old, or a girl, um, who uh, a police sergeant and I interviewed um, a number of years ago. She had been a prostitute at age 15. And we said, what, um, uh, we asked her, what would have made a difference for you to have you not be... Um, not be prostituted. Uh, and she said, food. She said, food. Um, my dad uh, uh, locked the food in his, uh, in his room, wouldn't let my brother and me um, at it. I was hungry, and this seemed to be something that I had to do. And there are so many stories um, like that, so many ways in which vulnerability fuels exploitation. Um, and I certainly see, saw in my work as a domestic violence prosecutor that it fuels domestic violence, fuels sexual assault. And so many ways that, um, if you go back to the, to the thought of the, the triangle, that, uh, that, that uh, exploitation is fueled by um, this sense that, uh, that people who are entitled, um, people who have power, 
very often men who have power can take advantage of, of women, of vulnerable people, of young people um, who do not. So we need to focus our efforts on the center of those three circles. And it's my thesis and my thought that um, moving to a regime where we are focusing our law enforcement efforts, our justice efforts, our societal efforts on holding offenders accountable and supporting the people who are there, uh, supporting, pardon me, holding exploiters accountable and lifting up and supporting those um, who they are exploiting, that is the right way to go. And I'm hopeful that our society moves in that direction. So many thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today and um, appreciate it. Thanks, all done. Am I all done? Do I take questions? What, what? questions first, sure. Uh, yeah, we got a couple couple minutes. Yeah. yeah. Questions. Oh yeah, sir. Yes. Yeah, Peter. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Hi, sorry. So um, you were saying in the juvenile realm that uh, you, we're not criminalizing the kids. We are sending them into child protection. Right? Yeah. Child protection then has the ability to enforce court systems, right? Send them to counseling, send them to shelter, etc. Um, are you proposing an analogous plan in the adult system then? Because there is no child protection mechanism for adults. Yeah, no, you, yeah, so you point out a great point. So that uh, for those who couldn't hear or, or for, uh, for the recording, um, the point is that uh, we do in the safe harbor system, um, we are still keeping kids within the justice system, right? We're just moving them from the juvenile justice system to the child protection uh, system or a different kind of different part of the juvenile justice system. Let me make sure that I'm using my terms correctly. I'm seeing my, the judges here. Um, uh, but they're still within the justice system. And it's true that for Safe Harbor for All, um, we don't have uh, an obvious equivalent on the, second, on, the, on the other hand, moving from the criminal justice system. Um, my gut tells me that, uh, that we probably won't have, have that. Um, the people involved are adults. And um, I guess I'm not sure how, um, how comfortable I am with having uh, some system in which there'd be some sort of enforcement. Um, that would go on. I suppose that's something that we will figure out over time. I'm not aware in the societies that have the Nordic model that again went from full legalization to that model instead of the other way around like we, we, we would be. Um, I'm not aware that they have a justice system response once they've um, decriminalized. Instead they have a support and, uh, support and services response. Uh, but you point out, that you're absolutely correct, that would be a different aspect of this um, potentially than it would be with respect to kids. So, yes, sir. Do we have evidence about the effect of the Nordic model of the countries that have adopted it on uh, sex trafficking for minors? Yeah, so uh, the question is, do we have evidence on the effects of the Nordic model for sex trafficking of minors? Uh, and so I believe uh, that in general, they found, the thought has been that, that trafficking has gone down. Um, I don't know if it's been developed, the focus directly on minors. Um, uh, again, what I find a little bit hard about the evidence is that you're looking at a very different regime, yeah. right? Um, and so it's hard. Uh, I, I've kept on hoping to find a jurisdiction around the world that's gone the way that we would be and have not um, found that. Um, uh, but, um, but in general, I think the results have been quite positive, um, I think, in sort of each of the subgroups studied, as far as I know. But I will admit I don't have that, um, that right now. Yeah. So, so sir, yeah. So you Well, and, and so, so, so the question is um, uh, looking at uh, uh, providing societal support for adults. Um, and, uh, and, and, and really, I will say that, that uh, your point uh, is absolutely embedded in what I'm trying to talk about, that we, um, we've so much had a shift with respect to the exploitation of minors. And so much this thought of, boy, if somebody is under the age of 18, we are going to just throw all kinds of resources at that and all, and all kinds of societal change and have not done that with adults. The reason I guess that I made the point about there not being societal support is that unfortunately in my work as a legislator, I see every day that we don't provide 
um, the support that I think that we should for all kinds of people who are experiencing vulnerability and marginalization. Um, and so it's hard for me to think about um, the adults who've been prostituted um, as, I mean, they absolutely need our support. And so do lots and lots of other people who we are not doing right by. So um, what I support, um, much more robust um, uh, services support for all kinds of people experiencing marginal marginalization and vulnerability, I certainly would. And by the way, I think that that would be the, the financially smart thing to do. I think that's the better thing, the morally smart thing to do. I think it's the right thing to do. Um, I'm just seeing uh, what we do with other people. I'm feeling like, well, at the very least, could we not criminalize their own exploitation? Like, could we start with not criminalizing it? And absolutely, we'd need to, to be moving as part of that to provide these services. I should note, too, I was surprised, I should have noted this as a hurdle, um, a number of the advocates for exploited people, for people working with, um, with those who have been prostituted, have been very reluctant about Safe Harbor for All. Not, in my experience, not because uh, they don't support uh, they wouldn't uh, want to have there not be a criminal sanction, if you can follow those, those double negatives. But their worry is that, um, at least right now, uh, through the justice system, there's some kind of services of support. And if that goes away and there's no services coming in, um, they're really worried about what the effect will be. So actually, some of the people who've been wanting to move slowest on Safe Harbor for All have been advocates for prostitute people because of concerns about what, where that's going to take us and where we're going to be. So. I would think maybe just one more yeah, question, one more. perhaps. Yeah, just one more, yeah. If anybody has, and no need if not. I, I have a quick question. Oh, yeah, sure, sorry. Um, what is your take on uh, the Nordic model actually getting a hold of the traffickers, right? You said that was a, a main part of your triangle and a main part of your concern. Does the Nordic model have anything to, you know, really quash those people? Yeah, does anything, the Nordic model have anything to do with, with traffickers? Yeah, I mean, I think that's actually one of the hidden huge advantages of the Nordic model. Um, right now, we as a society are saying to victim survivors, um, you've experienced this. First of all, if you're under 18, you've experienced awful things, uh, and we're going to provide all kinds of support. Once you get one day older, then we can criminalize you, but oh, we want to go after the person who's trafficked you, who, by the way, may well have been the person who's been meeting your needs, not well, but the person who's been, um, who's been kind of the constant in your life. We're going to go after that person, um, and uh, we're going to punish you equally with the person who's been, who's been buying you. It ends up being a real mess. Um, by sending the message, by saying, we understand that you have, that you have vulnerabilities, that you are experiencing this, um, that this is something that you are a victim survivor of rather than something where you are a criminal with respect to this, then, in my experience anyway, you really can set up a partnership with the victim survivor where she is much more quickly in a place where she can, if she's comfortable doing so, and often she is, with providing evidence against her trafficker, providing information. I mean, the expert on the situation is the person who's experienced it, right? Ideally, she is leading the way. We need to be providing support for her to lead the way. You don't provide support by first um, threatening to uh, charge her or potentially actually charge her, and even having it be possible that she could be charged. So I, I think that going after traffickers is much more effective. I will say I don't know specifically in the countries that have adopted the Nordic model exactly how that's worked. Um, but again, it's, it's somewhat different regimes, so I think it's a little bit hard to compare. So it sounds like that's all we have for questions. Um, many thanks to the journal, to all of you as well. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Lauren Martin. Uh, Dr. Martin is the Director of Research at the University of Minnesota Urban Research Outreach Engagement Center, as well as a affiliated faculty at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs. Dr. Martin has been nationally recognized for her community-based action, action research in the area of sex trafficking and sex trading. She is also the author of numerous community and scholarly publications and knowledge production and parenting in poverty, poverty, as well as helping to found and develop programs, policy, and prevention. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Martin. All right, is this thing on? Can you guys hear me okay in the back? Yeah? Okay. Um, thank you, I'm really pleased to be here. Uh, what I'm gonna do today is share some findings from a recent study that we just completed on sex buyers. Um, before I get into it, I also want to thank, I know he had to leave, but uh, Representative Pinto really 
uh, provided a great context. Um, so I hope as I'm talking, you'll think about um, and just keep in your minds the context that he provided. Because what I'm going to do is pivot a little bit to talk about a different part of the market that we, uh, we, we know a lot less about, and that is um, sex buyers. Most of my work has been looking and working with people who are victims in sex trafficking and people who are involved in sex trading. So this was a new shift for me as well. Um, let's see. Oh, before I get into it, too, I also want to thank and acknowledge that uh, this report that we've completed on sex buyers at UROC could not have been done without the support of lots and lots of people across the state. It's a statewide study. We had help from hundreds of people. Uh, we had funding from the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, and we had a team of 18 uh, research staff who helped us do this project uh, that I'm going to tell you about. So just a really quick overview. Essentially what our study does is attempts to address um, a very significant gap in research uh, policy and practice about the people who purchase sex. Um, and this is often referred to as the demand side of the commercial sex market. So there's some really, really basic questions about the demand side that we don't yet have uh, good answers for. And this study was an attempt to try to develop some of that. So the basic questions that we looked at were, who purchases sex in Minnesota? Because as Representative Pinto talked about, uh, the focus has been primarily on uh, people who are uh, selling sex, not people buying sex. So there's a great deal of just really basic stuff to know about who's purchasing sex. Uh, we wanted to know where do sex buyers live and where do they purchase sex? Because there has been some misconceptions across the state that this is an urban problem or this only happens in certain places. So we wanted to get a statewide sense. Where is this happening? And then we wanted to understand how. So how do sex buyers encounter the marketplace? How do they approach it? We know a lot about how traffickers and other people uh, engage in this marketplace. And I think Dave showed a really helpful, that triangle was a really helpful image. But how do sex buyers know about the marketplace and enter it. And then we wanted to know a little bit about what. So what is it that sex buyers are seeking to purchase? Um, that helps us know, it helps us understand what's happening a little bit more in the marketplace. And, and these questions, as I say, basic questions are really critical, I think, for understanding the scope and scale of the commercial sex market in Minnesota, uh, the role of trafficking and commercial sexual exploitation within that market, and uh, also understanding um, how do we look at uh, identification of strategies and things like that to combat sex trafficking and exploitation within this marketplace. So if we don't know the basics about the demand side, how are we going to develop policy and practices that are going to um, prevent uh, harm? So a teeny bit, I want to back up. So the work that we're doing, uh, or I should say this study, builds on previous work that UROC did um, in partnership with uh, Oteoni Research. Um, Sandy Pierce is a researcher in Minnesota. We worked together on a study called Mapping the Market for Sex with Trafficked Minor Girls in Minneapolis. And this study, uh, again, we really were trying to understand within Minneapolis what, what is the operational structures? How does trafficking work? And I'm not going to go into a whole thing about that study, um, but I did want to just highlight um, just a couple of points from that study because it provides some context and it tells you how we came to um, looking at the demand side. Um, so really what our study did was uh, examine the marketplace from the perspective of operations, sex trafficking operations, and we really documented the use of exploitation, violence, manipulation, um, and things like that to develop a supply of juvenile victims. And I think Dave talked a lot about this in the previous presentation. I want to highlight just a couple of points from that study because they're really relevant uh, when we think about the demand side. Um, so our focus on, in this previous study, was juveniles. And really what we saw was there's a significant over-representation of juveniles of color uh, as victims in sex trafficking. And that's primarily African American and American Indian uh, kids. And also girls living in poverty. Um, and some of the factors that make uh, young people vulnerable um, are kind of displayed in this uh, diagram, you know, the uh, poverty, homeless, cognitive delays, um, drug abuse, not having a supportive adult. So these are things that are going on in young people's lives. Um, things, so that's uh, peers and other kids, um, some working for traffickers, some not, kind of 
helping people uh, connect to the market in that way, looking at um, rape and gang rape as uh, significant strategies that uh, traffickers use to uh, break girls and bring them into operations. So we, we found a significant amount of violence uh, going on in, in that part of um, the marketplace. And finally, we were um, able to identify how those, if we think about traffickers and victims as a unit or an operation, how those operations connected uh, victims to sex buyers. And that's um, on the bottom, we, we identified four, escort, brothel and brothel-like, street-based, and closed sex buyer networks. So this is from the juvenile um, side of things. Uh, we also found that traffickers and victims tend to live in the same neighborhoods, uh, and those tend to be neighborhoods with very high rates of poverty. When we looked at sex buyers uh, that had been identified by the Minneapolis Police Department, bless you, <laughs> uh, we found that they live all across the metro. So they're not living in the same neighborhoods that traffickers and victims are living in. But because our focus was on Minneapolis, we weren't able to really visualize who's purchasing sex, even in Minneapolis. So that's when we realized, okay, we really have to expand this focus. We can't just focus on one city. We have to focus on, on a much larger geographic area. But of course, this creates um, a huge problem in terms of data and how do we, how do we get at information about this. Um, so just a teeny bit about framing. This is a slight variation on um, the map that or the triangle that Representative Pinto showed, but it's kind of the same concept. Um, so the framing of our study, mapping the demand, you know, we really look at this as a marketplace. It, it can be hard to do that because we're talking about people, but it's important that we do that because that's the logic that's happening uh, within uh, trafficking and commercial sex. Um, so when I say commercial sex, just to define some of my terms, what I'm talking about is trading sex acts or sexual contact for anything of value, including money, food, shelter, drugs, or gifts. Um, and when I'm talking about the overall marketplace, um, I'm going to refer to that as the commercial sex market or the marketplace for sex. So trafficking and exploitation are part of a larger marketplace, right? Um, so when I use the term sex buyer, I'm talking about a person who obtains sex or sexual activity with money or a trade of something of value. Um, and then when we think about the supply, the sort of supply side, um, there are people who provide the sex act to the sex buyer. And as we've just talked about, there's a great deal of exploitation that goes on there. So we use the composite term provider victim because what we're trying to do is talk about the role. And then we want to highlight that many people in that role are victims of exploitation and trafficking. But I think it's important to note that not all people in that role uh, see themselves as victims. Um, and some people in that role see themselves as choosing this. So that, that's when we start to move into the full commercial sex market and understanding sex buyers, we, ha we have to grapple with the many different experiences that provider victims uh, come to that marketplace with. Um, and then there's the distribution role, which uh, I think we know what that means. Let's see. So just a teeny bit. Oh, no, I don't know why the print's so teeny there. But just a little bit about the um, uh, what other research has said. Um, so this is the least well understood part of this marketplace. Um, but there has been some research. So we know that there's a lot of, as I just mentioned, a lot of different experiences of, of provider victims um, in the marketplace and a lot of different things that bring them there. Um, there's been a lot of research around um, two segments of sex buyers that are not representative of the whole population. So uh, sex buyers who've been arrested by police in street-based sting operations. Uh, there's been a lot of research there and there have been a lot of research because uh, oftentimes they get referred to what's called a John School. Um, and then researchers have connected with John Schools and connected with those sex buyers. But they're really not representative of the broader uh, group of men who are purchasing sex. The other group is almost the opposite group, and it's a group of uh, people who call themselves um, hobbyists, meaning that it is, it is their hobby to purchase sex. And they're part of uh, an, an online community. And they, um, so there's a website called The Erotic Review. And so it's people, and it's not just that website, but people who subscribe, they form a group 
and they talk about this and share information. Um, and as I said, they refer to themselves as hobbyists. Um, so there's been a lot of research with them. Um, and again, they're not representative of most sex buyers in terms of uh, wealth levels and uh, their interactions in the marketplace. So these are two very different subgroups of people who purchase sex. We don't have any good research on the kind of general population, and we don't have good research about how different market segments, how people who participate in different market segments interact and who they are. And then in terms of prevalence, um, there's some wildly various variant uh, ideas about the prevalence of sex buying. So that how many uh, men actually purchase sex. So in our study, we were really only able to find um, one study that looked at this and uh, that used a representative sample. And they found that about 14% of men in the US have ever purchased sex. And about 1% of men in the US have purchased sex in the previous year to that study. So 1% of men in Minnesota is about 22,000 people. Just to give a sense of the scale. So a teeny bit about methods of our study. So our study was not a prevalent study. Our study, as I said, Really what we tried to do was use community-based and mixed methods to um, collect data from across the state, um, particularly surface knowledge from stakeholders across jurisdictions, professions, geography. Um, we talked to people in small towns and urban areas all across the whole state. So we interviewed 157 people, about half were criminal justice professionals, about half were social service providers and advocates, and these are individuals who have direct contact with the marketplace. Um, we didn't want to talk to sex buyers or um, provider victims at this point because we wanted to get more of a lay of the land, and it can be quite traumatic to talk with people who are involved in the um, commercial sex market as provider victims. It can be traumatic for them, so we didn't want to go there. We talked to sex buyers. We don't know yet how to place people within an overall marketplace, right? So we wouldn't know if if the people we were talking to, where they would fit. So we wanted to first surface this kind of um, community-based knowledge. We also looked at law enforcement uh, records, which I'm going to say are um, very incomplete, at, even in terms of um, we looked at Minnesota court information systems. So these are people who were charged. Um, and what we realized is that, that the advantage of that data set is it's statewide. The disadvantage is that most local police departments don't actually uh, refer information to MNSYS. So I'll just give you an example. When we, um, the Minnesota Court Information System says there are about two people in Duluth who've been charged with prostitution. When you talk to the Duluth Police Department, it's actually more like 71, right? So there's a, there's a real data problem here. Um, and we also looked at print news media coverage because, uh, it, interestingly, news coverage about sex buyer stings actually provides us more information about people purchasing sex and people who've been arrested than the Minnesota Court Information Systems does because local newspaper uh, stories are reporting on it and it's in the paper and so we were able to um, actually identify quite a lot of um, arrests that way. Um, all data sources have inherent strengths and weaknesses so we try to get as many different sources together um, for this study as we can. And again, really trying to build this sort of lay of the land, just kind of basic stuff. Okay. Ooh going way too slow. I have until what time? 10, 10, 15? Uh, yes. Okay. We'll let you go a little farther. Okay, I'm going to speed up though. Um, <laughs> all right, I'll highlight, <laughs> I'll highlight some key findings. I've realized I've spent way too much time building it up and I haven't even gotten to the findings. Um, okay, so I'm going to just basically go through this the who, where, how, and what, and just share a little bit about our findings. Um, so generally speaking, um, who purchases sex? Uh, well, what we found is it's representative of the men in Minnesota. 85% of the state of Minnesota is white. Therefore, most sex buyers in Minnesota are white. They range in age um, from 18 to 70, from the people who have been identified. So it's kind of the whole uh, spectrum of men. They're really demographically similar to the communities that they come from. Um, we found a huge range of occupations, including CEOs, truckers, farmers, businessmen, police officers, kind of any profession that you can think of, um, we found people uh, who are purchasing sex. In terms of where, um, it's 
so as I described, the sort of data problems, uh, data on sex buyers and where they live is really uh, difficult to come by. Um, so we use the law enforcement data and the um, data from uh, the print news media because, as I said, this is a, turned out to be a really solid source because print news media covered not only sting operations, they actually would use, list the people who were arrested, where they were arrested, and where they were from. So it was actually a very handy um, source for us to use. And what we found, and in talking to law enforcement and others, is that, um, first of all, people purchase sex across the whole state. It's not an urban problem. Um, and that most people don't purchase sex in the place where they live. So travel is a constituent part of sex buyer behavior. And we found most sex buyers travel on average 30 to 60 miles. Um, in the Twin Cities, the travel is a flow from the suburbs to uh, the first ring suburban or downtown. In small towns, it's a flow from one small town to another. Because in a small town, if you're purchasing sex, you don't want to do it in your hometown. Um, so this travel is really an important part of sex buyer behavior. Um, and the reason, uh, as I mentioned, that people travel is anonymity, privacy. Um, sometimes people are seeking a variety of experiences and convenience. Um, so the most common pattern of travel that we found is really anchored around the work day. So people driving to work, home from work, and over the lunch hour. That's kind of the most uh, common area that we found. We also found um, lots of people purchasing sex during business trips and vacations. Um, as I mentioned, the sort of rural Minnesota moving from one town to another. Um, and then there are some sex buyers um, who purchase sex, who travel specifically to purchase sex. So these are sex buyers that are looking for something very specific. They might be looking for a juvenile. They might be looking for um, something that our interviewees called unusual. Um, so depending on if that's something that's available in their local sex market, they might travel um, somewhere else. And these sex buyers uh, will travel much longer distances than the 30 to 60 miles to purchase sex. So we'll, um, briefly on how. So we identified um, three, pri three ways that sex buyers approach the marketplace. Um, and I want to just emphasize this marketplace for sex is extremely complex and uh, varied. And everybody that we talked to um, emphasized a, a sex buyer could, in theory, purchase anything that they wanted to buy. Uh, and there is a market for almost anything. What I'm going to be talking about is what we identified as sort of a primary marketplace where most sex buyers um, participate. So. We identified three ways. Um, obviously, there's been a lot of attention to internet aided and talking about back pages where a person, where a um, provider victim posts an ad, and there might be a trafficker involved in that as well. And then the sex buyer sees that ad and um, connects that way. Um, while there's a lot of attention on back page, we actually identified 37 other websites that function exactly the same as back page. Um, and I'm sure there's way more. Uh, than what we identified. Those are just the ones that we happen to learn about. So this is not a back page problem, per se. It's more um, how the um, internet functions. And I just want to highlight the social media component. Um, this was something that uh, we learned a lot about. Um, and really, this is an area where sex buyers directly try to target um, usually uh, young people under the age of 18 through social media apps and, and things like that. Direct solicitation, um, that, would, that would include street-based tracks and other areas. And then this word of mouth network, um, so quite hidden. We found word of mouth networks at every economic level. And in this instance, it's um, very clear that a sex, sex buyers know what's going on because usually a word of mouth network is constructed or around and with a sex trafficker. So that's, that's when sex buyers work quite closely with a trafficker to um, obtain what it is that they're looking for. Um, now, what our data shows is that in most instances, the marketplace actually is designed to obscure trafficking. So when a sex buyer interacts directly with a person they perceive as an independent provider, and in most ways of accessing the marketplace, the provider victim presents themselves as an independent provider. Uh, so when a sex buyer approaches in that way, they aren't necessarily seeing all the exploitation and the trafficking. 
Now, from what our data suggests, they're not necessarily asking questions or looking very hard. Um, and the provider victim might even say, might give signals that they're not um, trafficked or that there isn't exploitation involved. Um, and this was particularly strong with internet-aided and direct solicitation where the, the mode of entry into the marketplace is, is a sex buyer connecting directly with a provider victim. And I'm so, I apologize for my slides. I don't know why the, why the, <laughs> the words got so teeny. Um, but there are uh, areas in this marketplace for sex where sex buyers clearly know that the person is trafficked. So we found lots of evidence of um, sex buyers specifically connecting with traffickers to obtain a juvenile. Um, and we know that um, uh, some sex buyers connect with traffickers to obtain other things as well. I'm going to speed up. OK, what? So what do sex buyers seek in the marketplace? Um, generally, when we talk about this, we will say that sex buyers are purchasing a person. Um, so there's a lot of talk like that. What, what we found is um, it actually seems that what sex buyers are looking to purchase is an experience. And that person is part of the experience. So it's a, it's a subtle difference, but it's, it's important. Um, because what that experience is really about, it's shaped by the ability to use money. So it's power and control derived through purchasing power. And what the experience entails is widely varying depending on what that sex buyer is looking for. But that power and control from purchasing power is what shapes the experience. Um, so we identified a really broad range of commonly sought um, sexual experiences. Um, the most common one was um, quick anonymous sex, or the quickie. Um, we found all different kinds of sex acts represented in the marketplace. Um, the purchasing is really skewed toward young. Um, so most sex buyers are interested in young people, not necessarily juveniles, but people who are uh, younger. Um, most of our people we interviewed and uh, the data that we collected suggests that most sex buyers are actually looking for young adults over the age of 18, but many would be willing to purchase sex from a juvenile if a juvenile was uh, offered instead of an adult. Some sex buyers would say no to that. Um, let's see, we also saw that, um, as I mentioned earlier, some sex buyers do specifically seek out juveniles. Um, and then getting a little bit more, some sex buyers seek sexual experiences and acts that really uh, are designed to harm and humiliate the person that they're, um, the person in, uh, that they're purchasing. And these include derogatory language and racial slurs as part of the sexual experience that they're purchasing, um, defecation and urination. Uh, we saw that was a very strong theme, particularly with um, young people who are being purchased. Um, we saw rough sex, violence, sexual assault, rape, um, and in some cases, attempted murder and murder. So some of the people we interviewed, um, people do get killed in, in these uh, encounters. Um, and then we saw evidence of some sex buyers enter this marketplace, okay, thank you, because they have a specific hatred of uh, a particular group or class of people, whether it be homophobic or transphobic, or racism, and they go into the marketplace, seek a provider victim uh, to enact their um, specific hatred of that uh, group of people. So many of these behaviors, I just want to point out, many of the things that I'm talking about right now are fully illegal outside of the commercial sex market, right? But because the victims are people engaged in a stigmatized and hidden uh, activity, most provider victims um, don't seek legal recourse because the police don't believe them, uh, or they might be arrested for prostitution. Um, so this is a this is a, a problem for many of the many of the harms that occur in this marketplace. Um, people are not able to uh, seek legal recourse. Um, so I'm going to wrap up. So when we look at the supply and the demand, right, as kind of broad categories. Um, what we see, and I think Representative Pinto's uh, talk talked about this as well, 
we see really deep structural inequalities fueling this marketplace. Um, what we saw in our study is racism, sexism, and ageism are constituent parts of the marketplace and are actually baked into the marketplace in terms of pricing structures. So when you look at the price of an experience based on who the provider victim is, um, people will pay more for a younger person and they'll pay less for a person of color. So it's baked into the marketplace. And what, what we're seeing, I think, is an amplified version of what we see more generally um, in society. Um, so again, if we think about this kind of supply and demand writ large, um, when we think about supply, we're looking at poverty, lack of basic needs, and living on the streets as substantial push factors uh, for people to be engaged in the commercial sex market. Um, and in many ways, the demand, um, if we want to call you know, the demand, is filling those needs. Right? So this is really a, like a perverse thing that's happening in our society uh, in terms of we've got vulnerable people who don't, aren't being supported by our society. They, and this people purchasing sex is filling basic needs in many cases. Um, and I think this is a really troubling uh, trend, and it should really give all of us um, great pause in thinking about what is, what is it that we're doing in our society. Um, another important point, what, what is, so if we're going to try to end demand, because there's a lot of talk about ending demand, what is that going to mean for people, um, young people and marginalized people, who are in this marketplace? Um, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't end demand or anything like that, but I think we have to really grapple with this. All right. Um, so just in conclusion, uh, really what our study was trying to do was surface empirical evidence about uh, this demand side that we know so little about um, from the perspective of sex buyers. Um, I've talked a lot about some very, I think, troubling things. Um, I just want to emphasize that this is a very diverse marketplace with lots of different things that are, not all sex buyers are the same. There's no one size fits all. Um, so we're going to have to grapple with how do we do, what, how, how do we address this in a nuanced way? Um, let's see. I think I'll just end it there in the interest of time. Um, and then we time for, I don't know if we have time for a questions. A couple questions. Okay, we have time. Sorry, I went a little bit longer. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned that some buyers wouldn't um, use a, a underage um, vic, a provider victim. Was, was, is there evidence that they were like thinking about the criminal sanctions and the petitions, or was it for other reasons? What we saw is a little bit of both. So a lot of this evidence comes from um, police sting activities which have been increasing significantly across the state um, buyer, sex buyer stings um, and what police officers will do is pose as a person pr providing sex, they'll post an ad and they actually interact with um, in some cases hundreds hundreds and hundreds of uh, people who are attempting to purchase sex and in the course of those interactions on the phone and through text they can learn a lot about what sex buyers are looking for, even if they don't end up arresting anybody out of that interaction. And so what they find is, in the course of the kind of text um, communications, yeah, they'll, they'll say, I'm not available. Like, if they're posing as a person, they'll say, I, we don't have a person who's over 18, but my sister can come, and she's 15. And then the text interactions that go on um, sometimes they'll say, oh, no, I'm not interested in that, or they'll say, are you sure you're not the police? So there's indications that there's many motivations for why sex buyers are not willing to, uh, those who are not willing to purchase juveniles. It might be because they're worried about increased penalties, because Minnesota, it is a felony now to purchase um, sex from a juvenile, I believe. Someone correct me. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> uh, so those penalties might be a deterrence, but for some it's that they are looking, they really are looking for somebody that they perceive as a, um, an adult provider who's independent and wants to be in that marketplace. So we have time for one more question? One more question. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Well, it's, um, she had her hand up first, I'm sorry. I'll make it good. Um, I've got actually kind of two inter intersecting questions. First of all, 
What is your response to people who say, why should we bother these people with two consenting adults um, if they, you know, especially the provider is saying, I'm doing this willingly, even if it's not true. Um, and how do we respond to the fact that if you turn on a camera and record it, it's arguably protected speech and pornography? So, so the first one, I think, I think it, when we really boil down who's being exploited, I think it's obvious why we should care, um, because in our society, we're, you know, we have these structural inequalities that are baked into this marketplace. Um, I think anybody who cares about human beings should care about what's happening. Uh, I don't know. I could spend time to come up with a better argument, but it seems like like a ethical and right thing to do um, to actually care about human beings. Um, and in terms of the, I think what you're asking about is the connections between the commercial sex market and pornography um, and maybe other forms of uh, commercial sex, whether it be strip clubs or pornography. So there are intersections between this. Commercial sex is wholly illegal, but other parts of the marketplace are legal. So pornography, strip clubs, um, protected free speech. Um, I think, you know, sure, peop there are inter intersections, but from our data, there isn't a whole lot of, um, we didn't identify a whole bunch of production of pornography through the illegal commercial sex market. Um, it just wasn't something that people talked about. We did learn a little bit about webcams, but that wasn't so much as part, you know, webcam pornography. That wasn't so much a, a in the sex commercial sex market with a sex buyer where the interaction was filmed, that was more people who are provider victims also sometimes work in, uh, in the webcam side of things as well as another way of earning money. So we didn't find a lot of evidence of that. Anyway, I apologize for going a little bit long, and I want to thank you for allowing me to be here today. Our next speaker is Mr. Andrew Luger. Uh, Mr. Luger is the, or he's a partner at the law firm of Jones Day and the, uh, was a um, U.S. attorney for the District of Minnesota, a position he was um, appointed to by President Obama in 2014 and held until 2017. During his time as the U.S. attorney for Minnesota, um, Mr. Luger oversaw the largest terrorism prosecution in the country and developed a nationally recognized program to counter violent extremism and created successful initiatives to combat sex trafficking and gang activity in Minnesota. Prior to serving as the U.S. Attorney for the District of Minnesota, he served as an Assistant U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of New York from 1989 to 1992, and in the District of Minnesota from 1992 to 1995, where he prosecuted a wide variety of narcotics and violent crimes, as well as complex white-collar frauds. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Luger. Thank you. Listening to that reminds me that we need to update my bio um, because our office, and I'm going to talk about this today, and I think it's one reason why you invited me, our office, the U.S. Attorney's Office in Minnesota, not only handled the largest terrorism prosecution in the country, but also the largest international sex trafficking prosecution in the country. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Before I do, I thought I'd take a step back and give some uh, context to, to what it is I'm going to talk about and what it is I'm going to propose um, to you, food for thought, about where I think we need to go next in combating sex trafficking in the United States. Has any, you know, and you don't have to raise your hand if you don't want, but has anybody either worked at the Department of Justice, interned at a U.S. Attorney's Office, been involved in any federal prosecutor's offices? No. So let me, I figured that. Let me um, give you a little background, because now I find when I go to cocktail parties and I talk to them about this, because this is what I talk about at cocktail parties, which, is, <laughs> which means you don't want me at your cocktail party. Uh, uh, the Department of Justice is, is a little opaque to, to people. 
it's, it's basically there's a building in Washington, the Department of Justice, which those of us who live in places like Minnesota refer to as main justice. That's where the attorney general works, the deputy attorney general, and there's a whole lot of lawyers there who work on cases throughout the country in different areas, and they specialize, they tend to specialize in different things. Uh, and then I'm going to come back to that because it's relevant. I'm not just telling you this because you need to know. I'm, uh, it's relevant to what I'm going to talk about. And then there are 93 U.S. attorneys' offices around the country that really do the bulk of the criminal prosecutions at the federal level. 93 is an odd number. It doesn't make any sense. I actually do spend a lot of time at cocktail parties trying to explain it. So places like Iowa have two U.S. attorneys. Texas has four. South Carolina, Georgia has two. We have one, and that's sort of a fluke of when we entered the nation as a state, what our senators at that time asked for. And, and so we got one U.S. attorney, and I got to cover the entire state of Minnesota. I have no complaints about that, but it does seem a little odd that my friends in Iowa, who, who are like 15 minutes away from each other, had separate U.S. attorney's offices, separate federal jurisdictions. So in the U.S. attorney's offices, you tend to focus on cases that are relevant to your state. You sometimes interact with people in Washington if there's a case that maybe covers a broader range of states or areas. So for example, in the drug area, and I'm going to relate this back to sex trafficking, this is all kind of new in the sex trafficking area. But if I'm working on a heroin conspiracy to distribute heroin in Minnesota with the DEA and local police, we'll gather intelligence about the operation that's happening in Minnesota, we'll, we'll do our case, we'll work on our case, and I won't necessarily interact with people in Washington except for the fact that the DEA collects all the information on the people involved in this distribution ring. We had a 41-person distribution ring that we indicted, uh, mostly uh, distributing heroin on, on the Indian reservations. We took that down. All of that data and intelligence, though, goes to a central office in the DEA because they're trying to figure out where the heroin's coming from. And so they're collecting data to determine, is it coming from Chicago, is it coming from Mexico, because they connect the pieces, and then there are people at the Washington, at Maine Justice in Washington, in the drug trafficking section of the Maine, Maine Justice in Washington, who will look at all of that to see if they can put together the pieces so that the case in Minnesota might relate to a case in Colorado. It may be the same type of heroin, the same type of distributor, and we might be able to gather evidence from these two cases and other cases to make a broader heroin distribution case going all the way back to where the heroin came from. That's going on every day in the United States. Congratulations, you now know this. That's going on every day in the United States with respect to drugs and weapons, organized crime. It's kind of how America cracked down on the mafia so that you, know, you have bits of information from different places. Smart people who work in central locations, often in Washington, collect that information and put it together. So why is that relevant to what I'm going to talk about today? We're not doing that, for the most part, when it comes to sex trafficking. And that's not a criticism, it's a statement of fact and an indication of where I think we need to go next. So most federal sex trafficking cases and state, so did you, did you hear from uh, Pinto already? Okay. So, you know, the Ramsey County Attorney's Office sort of started off taking uh, the lead Lots of other county attorney's offices are doing this, sort of building up these cases, which are often one, two, or three people doing trafficking within the state of Minnesota. And Ramsey County's jurisdiction is right, so it's really within Ramsey County. When I became U.S. attorney, we reached out to the county attorneys to sort of team up. So if there were trafficking cases that they had in Ramsey County, but it also touched on activity that might have happened in Dakota County or Stearns County or somewhere else, we wanted to be the bridge to bring those cases together and bring them federally where there are some more significant penalties depending. We argue about that all the time. We used to argue about that. I don't argue with anybody anymore. I'm in a law firm. Uh, <laughs> And just sort of maximize the intelligence and the resources. And, and, and John Choi and, and Dave Pinto and people in Ramsey County were very helpful in helping us bring that together. And the case, one of the cases that we made when I was U.S. Attorney that I actually tried, because it should probably also go on my bio, I think, that, that, that was Lee Andrew Paul had been 
statewide and, and also across the region, trafficking mostly young, very young girls. Caught him uh, uh, in a horrendous case with a 12-year-old and a 16-year-old. Started in Rochester, went, went up to, to the St. Cloud area and involved other counties along the way. So we had police departments, sheriff's offices, working with the BCA and Homeland Security, who Homeland Security investigations at the federal level really take on the lead on a lot of these cases. We made a federal case that could have been a, a bunch of separate state cases. So that's one example of what federal prosecutors bring to the sex trafficking, uh, you know, fight. And Lee Andrew Paul was looking at potential life in prison. He had, I mean, what he had done beyond the two victims that we had in this case was also horrendous. But we, we had this young, she was 14 by the time we brought the trial, but 12 at the time that, that she was trafficked. Uh, awful, awful set of facts, which I, I repeat at cocktail parties, and my, my, well, my wife's asked me to stop, because uh, um, it, is, it is horrendous, and so I won't repeat it here, because my wife's voice in my head, but, but you can imagine horrendous things being done to this brave young girl, and she was tiny, uh, and decided she wanted to testify, because we met with her, and we met with uh, her friend who was 16, and you don't have to do this. We can cut a deal, whatever, whatever works for you. She's in therapy. We met with her therapists. And, and she just said, I'm going to do this, and testified. And you could have heard a pin drop in the courtroom. Uh, jurors were crying. It was hard not to. And, and, you know, sort of footnote to that is that when she was done, and it took a lot of courage, and she had to look at, at the man who had brutalized her to tell her story, walked out of the courtroom, high-fived, uh, it was me, me and another prosecutor in the office and, and the federal agent, and she gave us high fives and said, I, I've got the power, he doesn't now. And, and I tell that because we're very protective of victims, and we should be, but she's one of the examples of how actually the act of testifying and telling her story publicly helped her in many ways, and she came back and made a statement at sentencing. Those are the typical cases. <clears throat> when that trial finished in 2015, and we had worked hard on it, and I got to co-try the case, I was looking to, to, try, to try something, and uh, it was a tremendous experience for me. I gathered the whole team in my office, and I said, w all right, we're, we're doing this statewide. What else can we do? What else can we do to address this problem in Minnesota, which is so serious? And I had, I had assembled really a, gr a group of some of our top prosecutors working with really extraordinary federal agents. And they told me a story about, and, and I heard inklings of it early on in my tenure in the office, about Thai women coming through Minnesota, staying for a select period of time, and, and then traveling on. And just the pattern of it, it some tips, some work, some information, a little surveillance, it just didn't look right to the people involved. And, but nobody had anything solid. There was no, nobody had testified or talked about it as clearly trafficking. It just didn't look right. And, you know, these are decision points that, that U.S. attorneys and, and prosecutors get to make. Okay, we're strapped for resources. We got our hands full with cases like Lee Andrew Paul. Are we going to put the time in on this one? And there was something about the way the agent, who, who, who I'd really grown to respect, the way she said it and her intuition that I, I knew there was something there. So I said to her, I'm, I, you know, I'm not her boss. She's got a boss. I'm not it. But I said to her, here's what I want. I want you to take a couple of people, take two of my best prosecutors, go off in a room, and I want you to work on this and see if there's something there and you know, kind of pull on the string. So they went off and they did some surveillance of, the, of these young women coming in from the airport, typically went to the same locations, uh, taxi drivers, same drivers taking them back to the airport after so many days. They, they leaned on a couple of the taxi drivers who said, you know, this is what's happening. It's, it's forced prostitution. Sex. Taxi drivers didn't know all the right lingo. And so then came back to me and reported on what they knew. There's clearly a trafficking ring coming through Minnesota with Thai women, young women. Um, and so then the, the decision was, we're, we're going we're to find out where this goes. So 
I asked them to just follow these folks to the airport and get on their planes and see where they go. Then they went to Atlanta, they went to Texas, they went to Arizona. So we sent teams off to follow the young women, land where they land, get in the cabs, follow them to where they go, and the same thing repeated itself. They go to the same kind of locations, CD locations. It's clear they're being trafficked. It's clear they're being watched. And so we're now looking at a national sex trafficking or international sex trafficking operation. What are we going to do about that? If this was a drug case in 2014, 2015, 2016, I know exactly what we would do. The DEA would be talking to the DEA around the country. They'd have their intelligence center. We'd be plugging the information in, and we'd kick back results, and we'd, we'd know what this was pretty quickly. That mechanism doesn't exist yet in the sex trafficking world. And so what did I say? Existence of international trafficking and the need for resources, coordination, and leadership. That's why I titled this talk. It's a great title. That's why I titled the talk the way I did. Did I write that? OK. <laughs> And because what we have for the mob, for drug prosecu prosecutions, for gun running, we don't have yet. And so we, we start poking around. We ask Homeland Security agents in, in Phoenix and in Atlanta and in Dallas and Houston and a number of other cities about what they've done. What do they have on Thai women being trafficked in their jurisdiction, and different places had stuff. They had had some surveillance. They would looked into it. They kind of either they brought a, a limited case or they moved on for, for various legitimate resources. And I said, I want all that stuff. And I want it in Minnesota, and then I want to build the case from here. Not everybody likes to give up their intelligence, so we, you know, we ruffled a couple of feathers. Ultimately, we got all the information put everybody, some analysts, in a room and said, figure it out. And then we started going to, quote unquote, flip some of the people who were involved. So when you go, when these young women travel to Atlanta, they go to, quote unquote, a house. And that's their house, their sex trafficking house. Somebody runs the house. We had to figure out through surveillance who's running the house grab that person, tell them, you know, you're going to be indicted. Do you want to work with us? Do you not? And people started saying, yes, we, we'll, we'll talk. We charge a bunch of people, flip them. They start talking. They get lawyers, obviously. They start talking. And what we learn is this is massive. And it's all over the United States. And it's coming out of Thailand. And they're all coming out of Thailand. They're being flown over here. And they typically land in Los Angeles. And then you know, Minneapolis, Chicago, Atlanta, uh, Seattle, cities all over the country. And it's been going on for years, and it's big business. And that, you know, the women are promised, you go to the United States, you know, you might have to do this for a little while, you'll pay off a little debt, and then you're free, and nobody's free. And they're being lied to. Uh, and not only they're being lied to, before they get on the plane, the people who are recruiting them tell them, look, we're sending you to the United States. We need to be in touch with your families. It's kind of like, you know, like an like a overseas trip. We want to make sure your family knows what's going on, so we need details about your, your sisters, your brothers, your parents, where they live, what they do. And they build a dossier on every young woman. And those who get to the United States and sort of say, wait a minute, you know, 24 hours a day in, in, in one of these awful locations having sex with whoever you tell me to have sex with, and I don't get any of the money, that's not the deal that I thought I was getting. I don't want, I want to go home, I want out. Then they tell them, we have somebody sitting outside your mother's house. You don't do what we say, she's dead. So you imagine the effect that has. And, and then they remember, oh, I gave you all that information before I left. So you know everything about me and I'm going to do what you say. Eventually, I might escape. Some escaped. We ended up getting some of those to testify. And what we end up with is this massive sex trafficking organization run out of Thailand. We reach out to the Department of Justice, as we would on other cases, and sort of figure out, are there any people at the Department of Justice who can help us coordinate this? And there are. They work within the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. There's a, a small group of people in the sex tra human trafficking world 
They're very good. They're very dedicated. But they're kind of buried within a, another division. And when, so what I'm here to say is when something becomes a priority at the Department of Justice, typically it gets its own section or division. And it gets resources. And there's a plan. And there's a centralization of information. We made this case, and you can go back and look at it. It, it was reported on because we, we really wanted to blast out the news about it. Um, over 50 people have been charged, maybe more by now. And, it, you know, people are cooperating. We're unraveling this whole organization in the United States. And by the way, it's not just in the United States. It's, it's operating elsewhere around the world. This isn't the only organization. There are others. And what I would like to see happen is Homeland Security and others. We worked with the IRS on unraveling the money. We seized a lot of money. There's, this is a cash business, and you can imagine how much money is involved. It, it, it's, it's almost unconscionable. A lot of it going back to Thailand, to people who are running it from there. You need the cooperation of people overseas, but you need to coordinate this. If we're going to take sex trafficking seriously in the United States, and we're still figuring it all out. This is, this is not like drugs where we've been going after it forever. This is a relatively newish, not, it's not new that it's happening, it's new that we've recognized it as both a federal and state crime at that, at that significance. So the question is how to build in the resources, the structure, and make U.S. attorneys, give U.S. attorneys the folks in Washington who will help them attack this the way we're attacking other international priorities. I'm going to stop there and see if there are questions. If there are no questions, I'll keep going. I can go as long as you want. But I, I, I want to see if anybody has any questions. I've given you a lot of information. This is very complicated stuff. This is tough. This is tough work to investigate. I think it should be a priority. It's very, very important. And I think this is a way to, to turn it around. Yes, ma'am. Right. Well, two questions. First, there is a State Department study that comes out every year that sort of lists countries with respect to how they address sex trafficking. The government of Thailand has said that they are taking this very seriously. They were, they were in one of the bad, you know, there's different bands where you can be, and they were not in one of the good bands. They're in one of the bad bands. They're not the only ones. And so they've put, to, put in place an effort to turn this around. Whether it, you know, where that's going, how successful it's going to be, remains to be seen. As far as education is concerned, I don't know. It's, it's extraordinary. Um, I, I went to Thailand to meet with govern, government officials and to talk about this. Um, I, you know, all I can tell you is they've got a long way to go. Um, whether they're going to get there or not, I, know, I don't know. I hope so. But it's not just Thailand. Uh, so I, I don't want, you know, anybody to walk away that Luger said, hey, if we just conquer this thing in Thailand, that's great. It's, it's many ethnic, many countries, many ethnic groups, it's happening. And it's big business. And you know, these women live uh, under prison-ish conditions, if not worse. And they, they have no say in their life. They have no say in who they meet, who they can talk to. Uh, when they, whether they, if they go to the store, if they go someplace, they're accompanied by a minder. Um, many are beaten and brutalized, and obviously families threatened. It, it is absolutely horrific, and it's happening right now in, in most places in the country. Yes? Okay. On the federal level, is it, is both the supply, the supply and criminalized as well as purchasing? So there is, you can prosecute, one can prosecute those who are on the purchasing side, and it's, it's not as, it's more, that's more done at the state level. It, you can do it, here's the problem. I mean, it, at the federal level, it's, people are prosecuted more often for um, engaging in commercial sex with a minor, because that the statute is, is far more conducive to prosecuting at the federal level. That is done. Uh, more often, those cases are prosecuted at the state level. So in the case that I tried, the two uh, uh, men who, who had sex with this young girl were prosecuted in the state court system, not the federal. 
Yes. So you kind of talked about the lack of resources that there is for truly small business. Um, and what it sounds like is you need the resources to uncover the problem, but you can't get the resources until you uncover the problem, right? I, I think we've identified the problem. Okay. I, I think our case, you know, I like to talk about our case. I, I think this was a groundbreaking case. It's not the first time an international sex trafficking organization was investigated by any means, but it was groundbreaking in a number of ways. One, because evidence and defendants from all over the country were, were brought here and prosecuted here uh, under one large conspiracy, and it's still going on. Uh, two, we learned so much about this operation because so many people cooperated that we learned the means and mechanisms of the operation and how they structured themselves, the hierarchy. So this gave us a lot of information. And it seems to me uh, that it's now available to Maine Justice to determine, are we going to turn this into a national you know, priority the way we have with drugs and guns and other things? So I think the, I think the resources will flow if people want them to. Yes, sir. Good. Uh, would Maine Justice do this on its own, or would there be need for legislation? There's no need for legislation. It's not. It's actually it's fairly stupid. Not totally stupid question. No. It's no. They don't. There's no legislation needed to to sort of stand up as we've already done within the Civil Rights Division. There are these. There are these wonderful people. We could just sort of broaden it, and, and you know, obviously. Congress can tell them to do it, but they can do it on their own. And, and, and again, and the funding is there? I, it's within the department. So, you, you know, I'm not a funding expert, and, and I learned that when I was U.S. attorney. I'm not a funding expert because I tried to get a bunch of things that I couldn't get done for lack of funding. But this is, this is doable, and I, I just think, it, you know, as this woman asked, it's, it's still a relatively new phenomenon in terms of our understanding of it. So I'm not criticizing the fact that it hasn't been done to date. I just think now's the time. Maybe one more? Oh, you're telling me one more. You don't have a question. Otherwise, I'm going to call on you. Right. Yes, sir. There's both. I mean, there, there's local, you know, the guy that I tried, Lee Andrew Paul, local guy, wandered into Wisconsin a little bit, but basically a local guy. There's no need for Washington to play a role in that case. You know, sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't. These organizations, just like the cartels, just like, you know, the mob, there is a national interest and there's a, 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 a there's a benefit to be gained by having the national bodies, whether it's Homeland Security, FBI, or others, kind of collecting the information, gathering it, dissecting it, so that, like in the case, the next time somebody wants to do a case like we did, the information will be in a database. So we, you know, rather than hopping on a plane and following somebody to Atlanta, we'll kind of know what's happening in Atlanta. So. That's, that's my idea. There are probably better ideas. There are other people out there who have ideas. But I wanted to at least, since you're spending a day talking about this, you know, there's the local aspect, a lot of what you're going to hear about, and then there's this absolutely horrendous international problem that we took a stab at and I'd like to see more done on. So thank you. Our next speaker is Judge Jamie Cork. Uh, Judge Cork was appointed to the first judicial district in August of 2016. Before that, she was a assistant Hennepin County attorney where she worked for over 20 years in the juvenile division um, of that office. She has also worked in the Child Protection Division, specializing in sexually exploited youth and Indian Child Welfare Act. 
She has helped establish a statewide policy, training, and community outreach regarding the sexual exploitation of youth. Judge Cork is an original member of the Safe Harbor Committee, which established the Minnesota No Wrong Door Policy. And she has also trained and presented nationally, statewide, and locally regarding sexually exploited youth. Please join me in welcoming Judge Cork. This on. Okay, I'm sorry if I'm loud. I usually don't use a microphone. I'm pretty loud on my own. And I'm going to talk fast. I'm going to skip over a little bit of things pretty fast because I want to make sure that if you have any questions that I can get them in. Um, and some of it was already covered by some of the other speakers. But I do want to let you know that I'm going to go kind of fast. This is what I start with every single presentation that I do. And I do this because I want us all on the same page in the room. These are victims. These are victims and I want everybody to be on the same page with that and that's why I start every single presentation that I do with the same thing. Children don't wake up one morning and say that they want to be prostituted by anybody. They are victims. I primarily present on trafficking about minors and so you'll hear me say that a lot. You might also hear me refer to females or girls I know that there are definitely a lot of boy victims out there too. Primarily what I worked with were females and you'll hear me say that quite often. So I know that you were told to watch a training video. If some of you are like me, you may not have watched that video, but even if you did watch that video, I'm going to cover a little bit of awareness because I don't think it's bad to hear it over and over and over again because many times we learn something new each time that we hear it. And it doesn't hurt to really sink it into our heads what it is, what we, it is that we are talking about. Over 300,000 children are exploited each year in the United States. Now we talked about, and uh, Mr. Luger just talked about international, but we're talking in the United States. Domestic trafficking. Many times people hear about trafficking, they think international only. And it's not. I'd say that domestic trafficking is a huge problem. The average age, 11 to 14. When I left the Hennepin County Attorney's Office and I worked in child protection, I reviewed every report that came in regarding child sexual exploitation. That number tripled from 2012 to 2015. It had tripled. In 2015, I had reviewed 153 cases or reports. And we were getting younger and younger. I was seeing kids that were 12. So it was getting younger and younger, and I'm sure that that trend is continuing, and not that it's a good trend, but it is continuing. The FBI has identified Minnesota as one of 13 places where a lot of trafficking happens. Not the top 13 or not number 13, but in the top 13. And the reason for that is because we have a lot of highways. I-35 goes straight down to uh, Texas. We have truck stops, we have a lot of international people that come in and out, we have the Mayo Clinic, and so there is a lot of trafficking that goes on here in Minnesota. And I think a lot of people like to think that that doesn't happen, but it does, and it happens a lot. I saw a lot of it happening all over the state of Minnesota and in other states and small rural areas that people prefer not to talk about it happening in. A Little bit about the human cost. What are we looking at, 85% of the victims were childhood sex abuse victims. That's why child protection is so important. It took a long time for us to get this into child protection, but many of these victims, even as adults, were victims of child abuse when they were children and slipped through the cracks. We didn't catch them. And so now we need to be providing them services. 70% suffer from an emotional, physical, or mental disability. I saw that in the victims that I had. If when they got victimized, they didn't have these things, they do after. They almost all do after. 83% are victims of assault with a deadly weapon at the cost of the commercial sexual abusers or at the cost of their pimps. And as I believe it was Dr. Martin said, they don't go for help because the police don't listen to them. They don't, they don't believe them or they think they put themselves in that situation. Significant rates of traumatic brain injury, chemical dependency. Many of the victims that I saw or worked with or survivors that I've talked to they didn't start being chemically dependent, but they were after. Homicide rate for prostituted women, 42 or 40 times higher. And I'm gonna have a little bit of statistics about uh, juveniles once they enter into the life. 
And when I say the life, that's typically what they refer to it as. There's a lot of slang terms that I didn't put up, but you might hear it's called the life by a lot of the people that are involved in this life. 92% um, of women in prostitution are, report physical and sexual violence. And if you think about that, people in law enforcement, when I've trained them over and over and over again, a lot of times don't believe sexual violence can happen to women that are being prostituted. This is what we're looking at, people. This is a young girl that starts out, that's where she ends up. That's what we look at. If you watch the video, I believe there was something similar, but this is the reality. There's a lot of statistics and a lot of things that I could put up here, but this is a reality. This is what you need to see because this is what happens. I saw young girls that I would have in court with me. They'd come back after being on run for maybe a month. They'd lost 40 pounds and they'd been gang raped multiple times. This, this is what we're seeing. That's the human side of what trafficking is. It happens anywhere. Anywhere that has runaways and the internet, which is surprising to a lot of people. I went and did a training in a place called Oswego, New York, New York, and they didn't think it was happening there. And actually, they're an international port similar to Duluth. So I looked up some ads for them. I said, here they are. Here's your ads. If you have the internet anywhere and you have runaways, which every place in the United States does, there is trafficking happening. Here's some statistics about Minnesota. One thing I want to point out, Day One Crisis Hotline, that phone number, if you know anybody or you think that you need some services, Day One Hotline can help you with those services. Risk factors, runaway, poverty, I think those were mentioned already, child abuse, domestic violence, homelessness, sex abuse, those are high risk factors. But if you look, and I, it's tiny up there, but 45 girls under the age of 18 are sold on the internet every night. 213 girls, and this is one of the statistics I was talking about. Victims that enter the life, seven, year, seven years life expectancy after they are entered into the life. 75% of victims are trafficked online. It's easier. We don't see what we used to where people are out on the street. That still happens, but it's harder on the internet to be caught. And what that shows us is, that's what it looks like, people. Many of you may not have seen a back page ad. That's what it looks like. Looks like a Craigslist ad. Looks like you're going to get a washer or a dryer. It talks about specials, before work specials. I know Dr. Martin talked about before work, after work. There's specials, there's two for one specials. These are ads, you see. This is one ad that came from here in the Minneapolis area in Hennepin County. Now, I took out the face, but if you look at that, chances are that young lady is not 19. These are what are on the internet. This is what you're seeing on the internet. You get that list and then you click into the list and this is what you get. It's like ordering a pizza to your room. It's sad, but that, that's the reality of what people are seeing and where people are buying this from. So we talk about, I'm covering the child welfare area. Why, why should it be in child protection? I know one gentleman asked the question about with juveniles, they go to the child protection system, what happens with the adults? Well, with the juveniles, I do think that that's some, some of the benefit is that and some of the things that they're going to have a hard time with with the adult is they're, where are they going if they're not in the criminalized system? But child protection and child welfare, human trafficking threatens everybody. It threatens everybody in the family. It threatens children, women. What I will say, what I, when I did a lot of these trainings, it was interesting the different perspectives from people. Advocates knew exactly who the victim was or who they thought the victim was. The advocates were very sound that it was the young child that was being victimized, and that's the victim-centered approach. When I trained child protection workers, they said, well, we got to look at it differently. We work with the whole family. Is it the family that's victimized? Is it the young girl or young boy that's victimized? Or is it the parents that's victimized? And when we looked at a victim-centered approach, I didn't think about it that way until they said that, and I thought, you know, you're right. I'd have parents in court with me crying. You know, you need to put my daughter in secure facility. You need to lock her up because she's getting abused over and over, and I find her and you keep letting her out. Then you have the other side, the advocates, you can't lock up victims. So it's kind of a cycle. And we can't always say that it's the parent's fault. So it's difficult when you're working with these cases as an attorney or whether you're working with a social worker to really get the feel for that on who is the victim. 
families suffer. I saw other siblings suffer where I returned a young girl back into a home and then the younger siblings in that home were scared because the traffickers were coming to the home and threatening the parents and then they were, you know, violence was threatened against the rest of the family. So when we're looking at victim-centered approaches, we can't forget the families and the parents of these victims when we're talking about the juveniles. Child sex trafficking, when I, was when I looked at the NICMIC, which is a national uh, center for missing and exploited children, this is the newest statistic that they have. <coughs> One in six of the 18,500 runaways reported to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children were likely sex trafficking victims. Now, 18,500 that were reported to them, up until probably 2016, Hennepin County wasn't reporting their runaways to NCMEC. So those are very, very skewed. They look like bad statistics, but they're even skewed because they must, they're probably a lot worse because there's probably about 100,000 children that should be reported to them, and they're not. It's just not a protocol that was taken advantage of. And 86%, this is a scary statistic, 86% of those victims were in social services when they went missing. And so that's scary because we as a system working for these youth are not doing a very good job. And when they run away, we need to find them and we need to put an effort into working with them so that this isn't happening. Because 86% of those victims, that's a high number. So they came out with some new, new things this year. This is actually the Justice for Victim of Trafficking Act and the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act. I'm reading those because we use just the acronyms typically. Uh, that came out in 2017. And basically what that said to states is that your child welfare agencies have to identify and provide services to sex trafficking victims. So even though in Minnesota the law changed a long time ago, it wasn't until 2017, till this year, that the agencies across the country were required to provide services. The, they need to train their social workers. Most social workers aren't in the state of Minnesota trained in child, child sexual exploitation. They don't have the training and it's, it's sad because even if you identify it and you're not trained in it, you're probably likely not going to do the effective services they need. It amends, it orders or directs the states to amend their definition of child abuse and neglect. So typically, people didn't view this as sexual abuse because it wasn't done by a parent or a significant other in the home or significant relationship person of authority. This basically said, what this did is it said, you need to define sex trafficking victims, no matter who the perpetrator is, as child abuse and neglect victims. So it pushed it into many of the state's child maltreatment statutes. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. This also was set with funding. And I'm sure most of you probably know that this is how the federal government gets states to do things. So if they don't do it, they're not going to get the funding. And so a lot of people right now in a lot of counties are scrambling. And I'd say the majority of counties in the state of Minnesota are still scrambling to figure out how to enforce these changes. The, there's a Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Acts Amendment. These are all amendments that happened this year, so they're very recent. The child welfare agencies and probation agencies, this is what I was talking about, identifying the runaways. They are required to identify the runaways, and they need to report them immediately. In the state of Minnesota, we have a statute that says they need to be reported to law enforcement if they're in foster care or getting services within 24 hours. So child protection social workers, when I was working in child protection, they reported them as runaways and they filed what we call social service warrants, which social service warrants don't go anywhere except the local agency you're in. So it does you really no good. This told them that they needed to report them to law enforcement so that they're put in what's called NCIC, which means it's a national crime database so that they're in there if they're picked up in another state somewhere. I would have runaways on a fairly regular basis that would be stopped in Tennessee, Texas. They didn't even know they were runaways because we had a social service warrant that was only in the state of Minnesota and not only just in the state of Minnesota but in Hennepin County. It wasn't anywhere else. This new law requires that the agencies, and these are for foster care kids primarily, that they report them not just to law enforcement, so they're an NCIC, 
but they need to report them to the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children within 24 hours. And the kids that I had that happen to, actually I had one young lady turn herself in and say, I saw my picture somewhere. Why, why is that? I'm not missing, here I am. But it helps. And the uh, NICMIC, which is short for the National Missing and Exploited Center for Children, they provide services. They provide a case manager. They will put out posters. They do a lot of things to help find these runaways. It also required that when these kids were, the runaways were taken back into custody or they came back into the system, that there was a debriefing that we ask the kids. Many times when you're working with kids, you'll find that there's certain ways that you need to screen them. If you ask them what happened to themselves, they'll say nothing. If you ask them, you know, where'd you go? A friend's. But if you ask them about what happened to their friend, they might be more likely to tell you what happened. So there's been a lot of data and research on what screening tools to use, but agencies are required now to at least use them and assess what services they need. And I have on here, it's called Title 4E funding, is dependent on this compliance. 4E funding, and I don't expect you to notice, but that pays for the majority of foster care. It gets a lot of refunding, federal refunds. And if Minnesota were to lose their Title 4E funding, I know Hennepin County alone, millions of dollars, just in Hennepin County alone. So if they don't comply with it and they lose that federal funding, which the federal government will come in and do an audit, to see if they're complying, they'll lose the funding. And it's unfortunate that the federal government has to do that, that they have to say, you know, we're gonna take away your funding if you don't do this, because this is what we've been campaigning to do. This is what we've been talking about. And the federal government has to come in and say, you guys do it or we're gonna take your funding away. It's not uncommon, that happens a lot. They also have the Stop Exploitation Through Trafficking Act amendments, which creates incentives for states. So if states treat minors as victims and they discourage or prohibit charging the victims, which is a safe harbor, not all safe harbors in every state include that though, um, and they encourage diversion, they are given priority on the list for federal funding. So state responses, and I know uh, Representative Pinto talked a lot about some of this, but I think you'd be a little bit surprised. Only 19 states and the District of Columbia eliminated the liability for minors on prostitution offenses. It's 19 out of 50. I think people think safe harbor and decriminalization covers the whole country. It does not. It does not at all. I went to New York and I did a training, so I did some research on their safe harbor law, and they're touted as being the first state to have safe harbor, and they were. But Clearly, it should have been uh, tweaked quite a bit because it is up to the judge there whether or not they go through delinquency or whether they go through child protection, or they, they call it chins there. Um, but it is up to the judge. The first time, they might get the chins. The second time, they may go through delinquency. So it doesn't decriminalize completely. And because Minnesota statute decriminalizes uh, trafficking for minors, completely, I think a lot of people just assume that Safe Harbor does that everywhere, and it does not. There's many different levels. 29 states provide an avenue for services for the victims. 22 of them are specialized services. This number should be changing as of May of 2017 when all the other amendments went into effect. They should be changing because they're required to do it, but right now, those are the statistics as of 2016. Um, Minnesota, and I think he covered this, Minnesota passed the legislation, and that is tiny writing too. Um, in July of 2011, I was part of that. We pushed through the safe harbor law. As of August 1st, 2011, child protection included the sexual exploitation statute. However, it wasn't until August 1st of 2014 that it was decriminalized. And actually what happened is it initially decriminalized for people under the age of 16. So 17 and 18 year olds could still have been charged. Before it actually went into effect, it changed. So before August 1st of 2014 hit, it did change to under the age of 18. May of 16, it includes the 18 to 24 year olds, that's for services. The safe harbor grants that went out always allowed that. And I think it's good for people to know because if you, there's a lot of victims between the ages of eight and 20, 18 and 24. 
They can get services through Safe Harbor, which include very specialized services, includes shelters. There's a shelter down in Prior Lake that has apartments where people can even have at least one child. They can have one child. So that's important for young adults. So it's important to know that May of 2017, they changed in Minnesota the sex abuse definition, which specifically now includes uh, sex trafficking victims. In May of 2017, to much people's, there was a lot of discussion about this one, but it, it is a mandatory report and it's a mandatory investigation. If a child is a, tra a victim of trafficking, it's a mandatory investigation. That was a huge, huge issue with child protection advocates back and forth and a huge argument. And the reason it was is because advocates didn't want to report them. And child protection, as busy as they are, didn't want to investigate them. And many people felt like they didn't want to investigate them because it wasn't the parents that were at fault. So there's been a lot of argument. I think we have been arguing about this since 2010 when I started working on the safe harbor stuff about whether or not parents should be investigated under male treatment, whether or not these should be male treatment findings, whether they should be mandatory reports or not. It is now pretty, you know, there is no doubt about it, the statute changed, that they need to be investigated and it doesn't matter who the perpetrator is. And those of you that aren't familiar with child protection wouldn't know this, but typically sex abuse cases are only investigated by child protection if as I stated before, if the perpetrator is the person's parent, is there is someone of significance in their home, someone that is caregiver for them. So they are not all investigated. I do it on time. Um, we came up with what's called the no wrong, wrong door model, and the emphasis behind that is that no matter what door these victims come in, they can get services. And Dave Pinto showed you, or Representative Pinto showed you the map about that. Hennepin County, just so you know, has their own wrong door uh, policy and protocol, and that can be, I have the website on there, but Hennepin County does have their own no wrong door. So there's a state wrong door, and then there's Hennepin County's wrong door. Minnesota had zero funding in 2011, 13.1 million in May of 2017 going towards sex trafficking. So we've made some huge strides in Minnesota. Housing and trauma-informed care increased from two beds in 2011 to 48 beds in 2016, and 60 beds is the projected. So it got to a point, actually, when I was working in child protection that I could almost place a trafficking victim in a shelter faster than I could place an eight-year-old physical abuse victim because the beds for trafficking became so much greater and we had a lack of beds for the younger kids. So it, it's great that we've gotten that many, but there are needs in shelter just in general. We trained over 2,000 law enforcement officers. Um, prosecution has increased by 76% of traffickers. So the, the increase in reports, the increase in prosecution is huge, but we've got a long way to go. Representative Pinto went over this a little bit, but I just want to cover Sexual exploitation covers a broad, broad spectrum of people. Survival sex, stripping, pornography, the prostitution, sex trafficking, any act, sexual act, or contact for any monetary value, food, clothing, shelter. Many times runaways don't feel that they're victims because it's survival sex for them. So who are the victims? I just want to touch on this. Boys and girls, boys are the most underreported. It's one in seven boys that are, are a victim of trafficking, and it's very underreported. And to be very honest with you, we have a complete lack of services for victims, for male victims. So even if I got a victim that was a boy, there, one of our shelters has a bed for boys, but most of the shelters don't even take boys. So a lot of times it's not reported, and that's pretty much the same across the board, even with sex abuse cases. So it's important that we understand who they are. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what you might not see. This is what is used for since, you know, to get everybody's attention. This is what they put out there. This is what you're going to see. This, is, this isn't really what you're going to see. So don't expect to see the bound victim and don't expect to see all the cuts and the bruises. Not that it doesn't happen because it does happen, but as, as a community, this isn't really, this is what they use to get your attention. This isn't what you're really going to see because this is what you're going to see. People that you would never suspect. 
it's not which it's not this obvious thing out there that people are think they're going to see. It's not all what uh, Mr. Luker was talking about the Thailand thing. That that happens. It does. But that's not necessarily what we're seeing domestically here in the United States. That's not what you're going to see in Minnesota. Families are vic you know families are threatened. I had many families come to me and they were threatened. But this is what you're going to see. You're probably not going to see the ones that are um, all beaten and bruised. You might. And eventually they get to that point. But when you're trying to be aware and looking at things, this is what you're going to see. I'm just going to touch a little bit on recruitment and pimping. These are books off Amazon, people. These are what we are seeing. You can buy a book on Teach You How to Become a Pimp off Amazon.com. They're in Barnes & Noble as self-help books. And it's sad. Here's a, something out of it. And this is sad, but this is a direction that they say. You'll start to dress her, think for her, own her. If you and your victim are sexually active, take it slow. After sex, take her shopping. Just buy her one item. Hair and or nails is fine. She'll develop a feeling of accomplishment. The shopping after a month will be replaced with cash. The lovemaking turns into raw sex. She'll start to crave the intimacy and be willing to get back into your good graces. After you've broken her spirit, she has no sense of self-value. Now, pimp, put a price tag on the item that you've manufactured. This, this is what people are reading. And when you're in poverty and you're looking at making money, this is what these young kids are seeing. And how many times has pimping stuff been you know, sensationalized? Pimp your ride. People are, you know, pimp's ball. Minneapolis was the host to the pimp ball a few years back. So, I mean, it, it is an ongoing thing, and people just don't even think about it. This is the price tag. This is what some people say, see when they see it. So, interestingly, there are more people being bought and sold at this moment than there were in the entire 300-year history of the Atlantic slave trade. This is no different than the slave trade, and we need to realize that. We need to understand that. I think Jada Pinkett said it the truth. People who are having sex with children are not Johns and Tricks. They're child rapists and pedophiles, and we should call them what they are. Too many times you hear Johns, Tricks, patrons. They're not. They're commercial. We came up with the term commercial sex abuser, but they are abusers. And people feel sorry for these people that are getting picked up and they're getting charged with misdemeanors or, geez, they didn't know how, how old they were and it's a felony. These people are abusers. So how can you get involved? First of all, be, be aware of the problem. Understand the nature of the abuse. Be sensitive to the needs of the victims. Contact your legislator. Support laws and funding and join a task force or volunteer. Be aware of what's going on. If you really think about it and you talk about the statistics and the numbers, there's at least 25% of you in here that either know or have been touched by someone that's been trafficked in some way. That, that's a lot. If you have teen children or you have nieces and nephews that are teens, there's a good chance it's been reached out. I have a 14-year-old granddaughter, and I was talking with her, and she was talking about friends in her class that had sent out nudes and didn't think that was, you know, she thought it was bad, and she got that. But people, we need to know this is happening all the time. It's pretty consistent. No matter who we are, it's happening. And my final note, my final last, I always finish, start with the victim and finish with this, that you may choose to look the other way, but you can never say that you didn't know because I just told you all about it, and it's important that you all understand it and that you do something about it because if you just sit back and you do nothing because you're not part of it, you're just part of the oppressors and you're part of the problem. And I don't have time for any questions, do I? Me either. <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned that we could volunteer to help. Do you have any organizations that uh, you would suggest to volunteer for? There are. There is uh, the place called The Link. They work with youth groups. They have um, regional navigator Tubman. They also have work, I think, um, Ms. Miller is going to be speaking next, and she is probably a little bit more familiar with the nonprofit organizations. But there are several different organizations. There's a lot of faith-based faith -based organizations that they have, you know, fundraising or um, cooking. There's like children's nurseries or any of the shelters that you can help out at and provide stuff or provide services for. Yes? How often do you actually catch the girls in the act? Like most, of the, I've been with these girls on the range for the last year, and I probably three to five times a week see girls who are sexually exploited and have all the traffic, all the trapping to be trafficked, but almost never are they caught actually prostituting themselves. They're caught hanging out with their pimps, getting, uh, picking up theft charges or disorderly conduct charges, in which case we can't address that part of it, the, the trafficking part of it, that's actually 
question to you, like how often do you actually get the juveniles who get caught and prosecuted or not prosecuted in the act of, of prosecution? It doesn't seem like it happens very often. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. They're not, not very often that they're caught in the act. I mean, Sergeant Grant Snyder, I worked pretty closely with him, and there would be stings and um, people in St. Paul where they would catch it, but typically it's not. It's looking for the high risk factors, as you said, truancy, runaway, uh, theft charges, drug charges, they'll hold guns for their pimps. So it's looking at those, screening the high risk, and possibly having some type of services that you can refer them to where they might find out from them. Well, 86% of them were in foster care. So sending them to social services to get services or child welfare now that they're required to provide services and they send them out for some specialized services doesn't mean taking them out of their home where they're in foster care. The 86% were actually in foster care, but you know, referring them to regional navigators. I had kids that I wasn't sure if they were being trafficked, but I'd call the regional navigator and they'd send them to some services even if they're high risk. Ramsey County has the RIP program where um, they have things for these young youth, even if they're just high risk and they're not confirmed to be trafficked. But how do you get them into You can just make referrals. Well, through the RIP program in Ramsey, and I don't know, um, Judge Milnacker's in the back, but last when I talked with Kate Rickman, who was running that, it was through law enforcement, they would do their 10 screening questions. But I know that I made some referrals to Ramsey County, and I did it through their, they have a joint um, probation slash human services unit. And I did it through them when I do. Because a lot of these are cross-jurisdictional. And I know a lot of you are law students. The other thing that's really needed is uh, volunteer, volunteer legal services for these youth. We did get a grant, and there was um, Irene Upsall through Legal Aid that could provide services. But they need somebody to represent them if they end up in court. Not just, I mean, they can sue civilly, but they also need people to represent them. Because as prosecutors, too, they're not always seen that they're high risk, and they're just kind of pushing them through the system. As you said, you're seeing them, you have an idea, but what do you do? Um, your probation should be trained in that, and judges should be somewhat trained. I'm training the fourth district judges this afternoon. Um, but knowing your resources, and I, I don't know if I have it with me, but if any would like, I do have a resource list that I could send out of places that can be called, not just day one, but it has um, shelters and trauma-informed care resources that I can send I can email to you if, if anybody would like that. Yes. Um, so I'm at the county attorney's office in child protection and they need to work next door to me for the teacher children and schooler. But I think the thing about reporting on minors is that there's a voluntary and then there are involuntary child protection services. In Hennepin County, we route a lot of our suspected mm -hmm. victims of sexual exploitation through voluntary services. And I think what I would like all of you to know in this room is If they're in on a delinquency, you may have. Right, but, but if you don't, yes. That's true. That's true, and that's happened a lot on a lot of the cases that I had. Yeah. There's not. What we did is we provided voluntary services until it got to a point where we couldn't anymore and then we would take it 
into court. Um, the other thing is offer services to the parents. I mean, not all parents are shut off, some are, but offer services to the parents because I had a lot of parents that would show up for court, they didn't know where their children were, and they, they were calling them in as runaways and sometimes we're told by the police not to call anymore. So some of it is offering services to the parents. I know I'm way over, so I apologize. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but feel free to contact me, anybody, if you want information. So let's do on your lapel. Yeah. Okay. There. How's that? Uh, our next speaker is Linda Miller, who is the executive director and founder of Civil Society, a nonprofit that provides uh, case management and legal services to victims of sex trafficking. Ms. Miller was previously an adjunct professor at uh, William Mitchell College of Law and received the Honorable Warren E. Berger Distinguished Alumni Award in 2008. And together with the firm of Robbins Kaplan, she brought a landmark child sex tourism case uh, using previously ignored laws against child sex trafficking here in Minnesota. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Linda Miller. And now that the appeal period is over, I can talk about the case. Uh, so uh, it was a, nearly a million dollars we got. Unanimous verdict, uh, eight jurors in the federal system. And those eight jurors were drawn from a pool of all over Minnesota. And we didn't have a single person that was from the inner circle. So we were addressing people. Now, I know that there's a lot of immigrants and diversity in rural Minnesota. But um, we were addressing people that had really not learned as much, maybe, as we have in uh, the cities about uh, the diversity and how our children are being victimized. So I'm going to rename my, uh, because of the really important, important lit uh, information we've been provided today, I want to rename mine uh, this presentation to be reduction of demand for sex with children. How to do that with prosecution and with civil suits. So <clears throat> um, first of all, civil society is a, uh, a nonprofit that uh, we have eight attorneys um, part time doing quite a broad spectrum of work, we provide civil legal services, not including civil lawsuits, and not including child protection work. Uh, but we provide civil legal services to remedy the effects of sex trafficking, stalking, sex, uh, sexual assault, campus sexual assault, and um, a little bit of domestic assault. So um, the first thing I want to tell you is that I'm going to reduce this uh, presentation to three major parts. The first part is the lobbyist buyer. And that's going to be sort of, um, I'm going to uh, talk about the Pena Bang, the million dollar case, in terms of hobbyist buyers. And the second thing I'm going to talk about is a demand reduction, a demand of a reduction of demand for sex with children, and how we do that through prosecution and civil suit. And the third thing I'm going to talk about is the Super Bowl. So, okay, first um, we'll go to the first. Um, the Pena Bang case was she was 14 years old. She was 12 hours from the capital city. She was told by a, a movie star, a, a person that said they were a movie star, a, a, a young woman, 
a girl actually, um, who uh, told her that she was going to make her a star and that she was going to take her to the cities, 12 hours by bus, impenetrable uh, jungle, really. <laughs> and um, then uh, they, brought, she, they brought her, and she was raped. Mr. Prataya is the person that raped her. He's an American citizen. He has a, a wife and 12 children here in Minnesota at the time. And um, he uh, was in his 50s, and she was 14. And uh, she did not know him ever before, but he did start sending her money. Um, and there was an intermediary who was <coughs> traveling with him. And that sort of makes it the hobbyist uh, situation because the intermediary was the same ethnic group as he was and same cultural group, language group. Uh, but Prataya had previous criminal conviction for sexual assault, actually within his own community group. And he was a, um, being an interpreter in a medical situation, and he raped the person he was interpreting for. But throughout our whole, our whole trial, this is 10 years later, he had an interpreter, because you have to provide an interpreter, even though he had already had a conviction for interpreting for a um, victim that he raped. So um, here is the quote. Now this, I think, demonstrates some of the attitudes that uh, result in the vast amount of sexual assault against children in other countries. So I, this is a, me interviewing, or me uh, doing a deposition of him. OK. I said, uh, I said, Were, weren't you worried? And he said, I wasn't worried about anything. I said, you weren't worried about her age? I said, I was not worried. Why? Because in the Hmong culture, I mean, if the daughter is 12, 13, doesn't matter what the age. Were you worried about the possibility that having sex with Penya Bang was a crime? I was not worried. Whatever I'm doing is right in Laos. So, um, this conveys a lot of the attitudes of what is happening. Uh, I think that many of our speakers have talked about the enforcement of uh, the criminal acts, the federal criminal acts. Those are very, very well developed. And the reason why is because Americans uh, comprise about 25% of the people that are going uh, to other countries and raping their kids. And this is giving the United States a terrible reputation. In, and the people in Washington know this because they've traveled in diplomatic circles more, and they have gotten these very strong laws through. But they're difficult to enforce. Uh, and it takes a special, there's, there's very minute laws called the PROTECT Act. And uh, they, there's many of the, uh, these acts, uh, these laws, and they try to fit each situation. Because, um, because you have the jurisdictional, how do you get jurisdictional over uh, the crime that occurred in another country? Uh, that's uh, the specific act that we used, and that's uh, USC, uh, 18 U.S.C. 2423C. It had never been used before, 
uh, in a, a civil suit. And then there's Masha's law that allows you to use it in a civil suit without a criminal conviction uh, of the perpetrator uh, in order to get uh, funds for the victim. So anyway, uh, we went ahead. I, I met this woman, a girl. She was still a girl when I met her in the United States. Uh, her father brought her here after the rape occurred in Minnesota. Her father was a war victim, uh, a war refugee from Vietnam War, and he was able to reunify his family with the Reunification Act, um, and uh, so he brought my client's mother, her sister, and her. Okay, now this is what you're dealing with in Laos. Uh, this is a photograph of my client. Here's my client. Here's her sister. Here's the rest of the kids. Now, this really <laughs> makes it difficult to enforce this. And, and the, the rapists know this. Um, there's no birth certificates. Um, they, they don't speak English, of course. This is their home. That's their home. This part that looks like sticks, that's their kitchen. That's where they sleep at night. They go to the bathroom in the field. So this is not, and this is what, uh, these are when these perpetrators are, go, are going over and getting these kids. So 25% uh, are either from of the travelers who sexually exploit children are from uh, the United States and Canada. And every year this is increasing exponentially. It's the sexual exploitation of a child by a person who commits such acts while traveling away from their own home or region. Thank you very much for your introduction of this. Thank you. And so I just uh, want to show you, I mean, uh, in 2005, it's estimated as being over a million children. And then in 2007, it's like 2 million children. Now it's probably 10 million children. It's recognized as, by many people as the worst scourge that our uh, whole uh, world is dealing with. Okay, so just looking, why is it occurring? Why are our children, be, why are the children of the world suffering this? And it's the attitude. We think we, uh, I mean, this attitude is like, I have money, I can do what I want, I can do other, I can do what I want in other countries. Uh, it's okay to exploit children in other countries. They don't uh, have the same laws that we do. Uh, it's, uh, we're helping them because these poor children wouldn't get food unless you, you give money to do this. Uh, sense of superiority, these people are from a lesser race, so-called, and nobody really cares about them. That's not true. None of these things are true. My mother, my uh, client's per, um, client is a person, and she has a mother who loves her, and a father who loves her, and sisters and brothers who love her. She ha now has a wonderful husband and children that love her. She's just like us, only she's from a different country. And um, we cannot uh, abide by thinking that we can uh, do this. And the one reason I'm so, uh, another reason I'm so concerned about this is I think that this uh, foreign market in, children, in sex with children is uh, creating a demand 
in the United States as well for sex with more and more youth. I don't have the data you have, but I've seen a lot of it. Um, so uh, there's this club mentality. That's the other word uh, that uh, we've been talking about, the hobbyist. They meet together. They talk together. They make phone calls to the other country and together. In this case, it's Laos. Laos is on a, you know, is almost opposite of us in their time period. So my client received a phone call in the middle of the night. And then um, more and more phone calls, and then money uh, starts coming into her. This is just when she's 12 hours from the city, never been to the city, and she, you saw a picture of her. Uh, so there's these, um, there's a belief that a criminal prosecution is necessary before a civil uh, case can be brought. Not true. A million dollars proves it. Appeal period is over. Uh, <laughs> Uh, lack of understanding of the federal law against human trafficking. Uh, my client was lucky in that her father brought her here. So she was here. So I met her. So I saw her case and I go, oh my goodness, I got to bring this case. It's going to be the first use of this law and we have got to start enforcing these laws. So. I'm going through this pretty fast. Okay, so we have three types of uh, child sex tourists. The situational, that's where there's the, these peer group, these hobbyists, encourage each other. And they not only encourage each other, they make it a uh, game. You know, who gets the youngest ones, how many, how many wives they can bring over here. Um, in my case, my client was not brought over by this, uh, by Prataya. Her father brought her over. So that made our case stronger. Um, so then preferential, uh, that's when their sexual activity focuses on young people under 18 years old. And more and more of that group, I think, is influenced, I, I think the the numbers of that group are, is influenced by this uh, hobbyist type of behavior. Uh, then the pedophiles, uh, that is a different thing altogether. It's a diagnostic uh, disorder that would um, increase the focus on sexual um, use of children. All right. so. Um, I told you about the PROTECT Act. The PROTECT Act is a series of laws. And so the, my, the series includes what we used, which is 18 U.S.C. 2423C, but there's B, there's E, there's F, there's A, there's B. Uh, so, you know, the, but the difference between C and B makes ours makes C more enforceable. Why? Because these people travel in groups. They go and visit family members, or they have other ulterior things they can say that they went there to do, for instance, a convention, or you know, a reunion, or a party, uh, you know, grew a marriage of some other people. They have reasons why they are going there that they can give. Under 2423B, uh, it required intent, that, they went, that you have to prove the intent of why they went over. So how many prosecutions have there been over the course of time? Three, <laughs> because it's really hard to prove the intent. Uh, because these people do go and visit their relatives. They do go to parties. They do go to reunions. They do uh, go to conventions. Um, and so they have that to give as a reason to go. 
And so they're going to get that reason, and it's going to be hard to prove that uh, they went uh, that they went over just to rape some child. And so 24, 23C, that's out the window. You don't have to prove intent. So uh, this is the um, 2423C, just requires US citizen or permanent resident travel in foreign commerce. The jurisdiction is uh, gained by under the Commerce Clause. So of course, if you travel, you pay money to get a ticket, you pay money to get a, have a hotel, it's, uh, it's without saying that uh, there is travel and foreign commerce. That's very easy now. Used to be a jurisdictional problem. And then to engage in illicit sex conduct. And that is uh, the only issue that the judge allowed us to even try, because the other ones were out the window as for, and we had already proven them. So. Um, what the PROTECT Act is, is a series of our criminal, federal criminal acts uh, against sex with children in the United States. So we have to, re re uh, we had to prove that by a preponderance. So uh, we proved that, obviously, and then um, we, and we use the 2423C, which doesn't have to, didn't, doesn't, didn't require us to show intent. And then uh, it's just that he did it. So we had to prove that he did it. And um, we were able to do that. Uh, we had a jury, um, well, my client, I mean, it's years later now by the time she was, came to the United States, well, she got pregnant, okay? She got pregnant. So she got pregnant, so he couldn't deny, right? Then uh, she came to the United States, so I had a client. And then, uh, then she um, had to go through the whole law suit, and of course we were, I don't know if you know this, but we were supposed to go to Hollywood and try the case, but that fell through. So we went back and got, and we tried the case here in federal court uh, in Hennepin, in uh, Minneapolis, and uh, won this case. So uh, by that time, she wasn't, she was like 22. Right? So we had to prove that she was 14. Okay, I only have a few minutes. I'm gonna show you how. How could we do that with hardly, I mean, with a lot of documentation, um, but uh, all of it sort of stemming from the time she, her father, brought her to the United States. So that was years after she had even given birth. Okay, so how did we prove? Can anyone guess? Okay, so mother, and my client and her sister came. My client was um, 14. We didn't have much of, I mean, we had a lot of proof, but it was all, none of it was related to the, the village, the village that you see there, the house that's in the village. Okay, so we, have, we proved this girl her sister's birth date. And no one objected to that. No one objected to us proving her sister's birthday. And then we showed a series of pictures that showed that this girl is one year, pretty, pretty much one year less than this girl. This girl was 13. This girl, and this is when they're a little bit younger. Um, but we have pictures of them as girls together, ones, two, ones, three. Or pictures of one, uh, they went to school, and one was seven, and one was eight. You know, and then here, uh, <clears throat> it's obviously not five years difference. 
So they couldn't prove that she wasn't um, over 14. Plus, uh, well, you can see how three, th uh, Prataya felt so entitled that in a deposition with lawyers there, he thought he could tell me that it's, it's fine in Laos. Anything, 12-year-old, doesn't matter what, they, what their age is. He felt he could tell me that in the deposition. This is how um, sure he was of himself. And uh, how the lack of, I mean, it's a disconnect, isn't it? Um, so anyway, we were able to uh, prove that. And they only put their witness on because he isn't very smart. I guess, uh, and he's so belligerent and thinks he's so entitled uh, that they thought he'd get himself into more trouble. Um, so they didn't. Uh, they only put him on for 12 minutes on the stand in federal court, and then our client was on the stand for five hours, and she went through every detail, 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 and. Uh, I don't know if you've seen any of the news coverage, but she is dynamic. She is the, a quiet, quiet person. She is a person where she, she doesn't speak English. She uh, is uh, shy, and she isn't outgoing at all. She keeps to her cultural heritage completely. But this person is strong. She was raped. She was wronged. Half of the friends of hers that were raped and like this wanted to commit suicide. And she was one of them that wanted to, but she didn't. She had her baby to take care of, so she had to. Uh, ostracism, I mean, the, the things they suffer when, when this occurs is in, incredible. And to think that uh, some people think that they can go over and not think about um, what is going to happen to the child that they've raped. Uh, just uh, it upsets me greatly, <laughs> obviously. So anyway, uh, I'm going to quickly, quickly uh, touch on the last thing, uh, Super Bowl. Uh, OK, we're having, uh, we're having another prevention. We, what we want to do is prevent, OK? Prosecute or bring civil suit. I think we have to prevent. OK, so uh, Super Bowl, we're doing a, uh, there's many different committees, and they're all doing different things. And they're, I'm sure they're all great. But what we're going to do is try to prevent. So uh, we have a lot of uh, positions available for volunteers. It's one day at the Cedar Cultural Center. We're having music. We're having MCs. We're having uh, food. We're having uh, hot drinks. And uh, we're uh, having art and uh, Photoshop and all kinds of stuff. So uh, if you want to volunteer, if you actually want to do something, come call me. And I put my cards over here. Thank you. Uh, just uh, thank you to all of our speakers. Um, you uh, really made this a extremely insightful um, and interesting symposium. Um, and thank you to our uh, faculty advisors and the rest of the board members um, who kind of helped put all this together. So uh, at this time, I'd like to invite everybody uh, down the hall for lunch in Terrence Murphy Hall 252. Um, so. Uh, yep, so it's just down the skyway. So feel free to join if you'd like. Uh, journal members um, be there and then the presenters and their guests as well. So uh, thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your day.